In the third trial pertaining to the January 6th insurrection, as CNN likes to call it, the judge agreed with the defendant. The police let them in the building and therefore there's no trespassing and nothing else makes sense after that. Oh, I just like to gloat on this one for a minute because the Young Turks told me, or they told everyone, I, I made the dumbest argument by saying, if people are fanned in by police with no warning to leave, you can't convict them for trespass. And here we are. Now, there was another trial where a man was convicted of trespassing, but this is because the same judge was like, You've, you climbed over some barrier and could clearly see it was closed off. So you knew what you were doing. But as for those who were waved in by the cops and had the doors open, we may be seeing a wave of acquittals for people who actually decide to go uh, on trial. In this instance, a bench trial. So we'll definitely talk about that. We have a major scandal involving Black Lives Matter. It's being reported, and this is, this is crazy. This is, a scan this is scandalous. Someone from associated with BLM bought a mansion for $3.1 million and then six days later sold it to BLM for $5.8 million. Where'd that $2.7 million go? And why, why did it happen this way? It seems some people believe that they were trying to funnel money from the nonprofit into private hands. So we'll go through that story. Plus, we're going to talk about, man, Democrats are in for an apocalyptic November. In Pennsylvania, Republicans are converting Democrats four times faster than the inverse. Demo people quitting the Republican Party are not doing it at relative to the other way around. Long story short, Democrats are quitting. So it's going to get crazy. We got some polls to show you. Joining us today to talk about all of this is the one and only Andrew Clavin. How you doing? Do you want to introduce yourself? Must I? Yes, I guess I, I guess I will. I'm Andrew Clavin. I'm the host of the Andrew Clavin Show on the Daily Wire. I'm the author of The Truth and Beauty, which was my, my latest book, and the author of a million other books, uh, mo most of them crime novels. And uh, here I am. Awesome. Well, thank you for hanging out, good sir. This should be fun. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here, actually. Absolutely. Appreciate it. We got Seamus. I'm Seamus Coughlin. I've never written nor even read anything as long as a crime novel. I'm a cartoonist. I have a YouTube channel called Freedom Tunes. Every week we upload a new cartoon and we do it on Thursdays. So if you guys want to go and check out the video we uploaded today, I think you'll very much enjoy it. It's about Disney and their proclivity for whatever reason for like having groomers working for the organization. Go check it out. Yeah, you got to see it to believe it. it. Yeah. It's also very much like how uh, with Katanji Brown Jackson, they were like the first black Supreme Court justice. What? Yes. And then it's like, I mean, aside from the fact, f fact that Clarence Thomas is currently there, Thurgood Marshall, I think, like <laughs> yeah. a long time ago. It's constantly first. It's the first time. And, and people have joked about this before that there have been about 13 instances of Disney introducing the first gay character in <laughs> one of their films. And I sort of took that and connected it to what's going on, added a little bit of a twist maybe, to it. I think you guys will enjoy maybe it. Maybe you should have a little sympathy because they may be caught in a time loop. Oh, yeah. You know, and they're, they're desperately yeah. trying to break yeah. out. That's how they're signaling to you. M maybe Joe Biden is doing their PR. He's like, first time, man. <laughs> first time. There's a gay guy in a movie, man. I, think, I, think, I can't let it pass that you also do the best Ben Shapiro imitation. Oh, uh, that's honestly, I'm very flattered. Thank you very much. I, I, I do appreciate that. And this is coming from somebody. Okay, this is coming from somebody who actually works with Ben Shapiro and knows him on a personal level, right, folks? That was good. You thank were you, able to maintain you. that you weren't Ben Shapiro, but you were Ben Shapiro. I was first. like a little bit Ben Shapiro, okay? Yeah. You should hear Ben Shapiro's impression of me, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I mean, Crossland guys, looking forward to talking maybe about God and the truth. Oh, I like that. The idea of objective truth. I asked you before the show yep. if you thought there was, and you said yes. Uh, that's a, con a conversation we often have because I think that there is no. I think that everything is subject. Every human, every human experience is subjective through that human. But we'll get into it. Maybe yeah, we can get into you, it later. You just happen to be completely incorrect. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love you. And there is no Timcast IRL without me. I have to be here in the corner, and I am indeed pushing buttons tonight. So let's get started. Before we get started, head over to surfinginternetsafe.com, and you can get Virtual Shield's virtual private network service. This is a basic layer of security for you as you browse the web. So it prevents creepy hackers, governments, and corporations from stealing your data. Now, no security is perfect, but it is a basic layer of defense. And if you're concerned about your data being stolen, this is a really good idea. Again, surfinginternetsafe.com. And as we talk about the January 6th incident and the committee, I'll just give you a good example. They, they've been subpoena, filing subpoenas to these uh, big tech providers to get the private text messages of individuals and the big tech companies are like, yeah, sure, no problem. Here you go. Just hand over the information. If they were using a virtual private network, they'd say all of the information we funneled was encrypted. We can't give you anything, but they didn't. So surfinginternetsafe.com. And you can get Virtual Shield 50% off for life. When using their VPN service, your traffic is routed through their secure and encrypted servers. This means any restrictions, censorship blocks on your internet are bypassed. 
It's free for 30 days, available on Mac, Windows, iPhone, iPad, Android, and Chrome. It does all the work for you. Your entire connection becomes secure, private, and encrypted. And it will actually encrypt your Wi-Fi connection as well, blocking hackers and everyone else from stealing your data. They got personal, family, and business plans available. Family plan includes 15 devices. Business plan allows you to add as many employees as you need over at Surfing Internet Safe. Virtual Shield has been with us from the beginning, so we're eternally grateful. Thanks so much, guys. Check them out. And don't forget, head over to TimCast.com to help support our journalists who write many of the stories that we actually use for this show. As a member, you'll get access to exclusive episodes of the TimCast IRL podcast. We will have one up for you tonight at 11 p.m. again at TimCast.com. So don't forget, smash that like button right now. Subscribe to this uh, YouTube channel. Share the show with your friends. Take that link, post it wherever you can, because we have no marketing budget for the show. We've never marketed this show. It's just organic. You guys have been sharing it so much. For some reason, people keep watching, and we, we really do appreciate it. But let's talk about this first story we got from TimCast.com. New Mexico man acquitted of charges related to January 6th. The federal defense contractor is the first person to be found not guilty of all charges filed against him in connection to the Capitol security breach. Matthew Martin, a federal defense contractor, was acquitted on April 6th following a two-day bench trial. Martin had been charged with entering and remaining in a restricted building, disorderly and disruptive conduct in a restricted building, violent entry and disorderly conduct in a Capitol building, and parading, demonstrating, or picketing in a Capitol building. U.S. District Judge Trevor N. McVadden said that the first charge of entering and remaining in a restricted building was a close call, but that there was a reasonable doubt whether Martin knew he was entering a restricted building. McFadden also said the government failed to show evidence of Martin crossing the police line, which mobs of protesters had broken before he had arrived at the Capitol. During his April 5th testimony, Martin said he went with the flow. So here we are. This is fascinating. For the people who tore down the barricades, tore the the, the signs down, attacked cops, well, of course, they're going to get convicted. There's video evidence of them attacking people. But we've long maintained that there is reasonable doubt for those, the MAGA as they call them, who fumbled and bumbled their way into the building as police fanned them in. So, uh, can I say I was right? I was right? Yeah, no, you're absolutely, absolutely correct. I was right! Andrew Clavin <laughs> right. agrees. Because I said this back in January. Andrew Clavin's seal of approval. You know, that very, it's very rare that federal cases go to trial because people are so terrified by the federal government because the federal government doesn't mess around. When they put you away for 15 years, you stay away for 15 years. There's no time off for good behavior. So when they come to you and they say, well, we'll give you four years instead, people confess and they plead guilty. But but you don't you just don't have to do it, especially if there was, as in this case, there was video of the guy being let in. That's yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and this is the video that we referenced back in January where you see the door open and then there's there's actual audio where you can hear a cop say, I don't agree with it, but I but I respect it or something like <laughs> yeah. that. And that's a cop. Yeah. Yeah. You've got cops taking selfies with protesters. So this is the third jury. This is the third trial. There has been one jury trial and two bench trials. The bench trial with uh, Judge um, is McFadden, I believe his name is McFadden. The guy was acquitted on the, the charges of disorderly or whatever. He was like, just entering isn't disorderly, so acquitted. But you did, you know, climb up an outer wall and you knew you weren't supposed to be in there, so you're getting trespassed. Right. But what's that really going to be? I, the, the, the entire January 6th narrative is in the gutter at this point. Well, yep. what you have, you have that, that uh, dis- disconnect between the Democrats' narrative and what happened. What happened was bad. I don't think you should charge into the Capitol. I don't think you should make our Congress people afraid except of being dis- you know, unelected. But they've turned it into the Reichstag fire. They've turned it into the biggest emergency that ever hit the country. And now we need all, you know, now every Republican is supposed to feel like a criminal. And that's ridiculous. Let's look, yeah. uh, let's, let, let me pull up the CNN headline real quick. This, this is how CNN frames it. Man who said January 6th was magical acquitted in U.S. Capitol riot case. You see, this is why people don't understand what's happening in the world. Because when you see that headline and you're a CNN reader or viewer, you assume this guy is a rioter who was violent. They called it a riot case. He said it was magical, but they don't give you the context in the headline. Right, of course. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, I mean, it's ridiculous. You mentioned earlier the fact that the federal government tends to convict. I think their prosecution rate is something above 95% because, like you said, people are usually willing to take plea deals. And it's not as if they're sitting there messing around looking for reasons to let somebody off. They weren't able to convict this guy because there was reasonable doubt whether he intentionally trespassed. And there have been, at this point, dozens if not hundreds of people who were there who have repeated this narrative that they were waved in by the police. They did not know they weren't supposed to be there. Obviously, people who broke in, who legitimately trespassed, who broke down the barriers, like you mentioned, 
those are criminals. But there are many people who thought that they were allowed to be there based on the conduct of the police. And so for the Young Turks to come smear you because you smeared stated, my good name, smeared the good name, <laughs> but smirched the good name of Sir Timothy Cast over his prediction, which turned out to be correct, is frankly hilarious. They own themselves. You know, what gets me really is that the process is the punishment in this situation. This, uh, did this guy sit in solitary for a year like a Probably. lot of these other people? Probably. So he's like in a state of mind where he's like, I'm going to take it to court because I got nothing left to lose at this point. If they're going to leave me in jail for a year without you know due process. I'm not trying to rain on this because this is great news. This is really good news. And it's it's definitely an indication that a lot more acquittals are coming. Well, here's what I'm curious about. So if we see more acquittals, I wonder which direction that is going to build political momentum. Because on the one hand, it could result in people seeing that the entire narrative was nonsensical and revolting against Democrats as a result. Or maybe it could embolden Democrats to say, these people are getting away with an insurrection, even though that's complete nonsense. And the judge was appointed by Donald Trump. Yeah, yeah there is that. But I, I still think, I think the people have got this exactly exactly right. They know it was bad, that you shouldn't shouldn't have done it, but they also know the Democrats have just played and played and played this card until it's it's absolutely maxed out, you know. Well, I'm sick of it. Yeah. But I think I think when uh, November comes along, we have a very good uh, likelihood, a, st a very strong likelihood that Republicans are going to get in. The question is, are Republicans going to do anything? And I'm not entirely convinced. The January 6th committee will be gone, yeah. and then the Republican Party will twiddle its thumbs and fall asleep. The, the Republicans get kicked out of office for not doing what they say they'll do, and Democrats get kicked out for doing what they say they'll do. I exactly. mean, because Republicans, if they would actually follow, as, as Trump did, in fact, if they would actually deliver on their conservative promises, everything gets better. You know, what are some of the promises that you like that you thought should have got followed through on? With, with, by whom? Just conservatives in general that you've noticed. Well, I think, for instance, immigration reform. You know, maybe we could stop people from pouring in over yeah. the over the border forever. You know, I, I think every country on earth has a border. Why don't we? Yeah. That's that's always a good one. I think cutting back on some of the entitlement that have driven us so far into debt that we're essentially a, a debtor nation with very little chance of getting climbing our way out. I think that, um, you know, the kinds of things that are happening in uh, Disneyland, uh, the, the magical kingdom, which has become even more magical if you happen to be slightly odd. Uh, you know, I think those are the kinds of things that a president should address. One, one of the things I thought was great about Trump was that he fought the culture wars, and I think that that's why he got elected, and that's why he was where he was. Can't, uh, can confirm. I, was, uh, I went to a bunch of the Trump rallies, and the young men that I met said, political correctness was a huge reason why they were voting for Trump. They felt that Trump's potty mouth was a pullback or you know that would pull everything back to to normalcy yep. in terms of our ability to speak. No question. I mean yeah. it's just no question for for 50 years, 60 years, they've been telling people in this country their country stinks, their religion is untrue, they're racist, they're sexist, they, you know, everything about them is terrible and their history is terrible. All the pride that America had for a country that after all did defeat both Soviet communism and Nazism uh, and, and was the only republic in the world when it started, it was the, you know, it actually turned being a republic into the default position. All of that pride that we had was just absolutely stomped on for 50, 60 years. And then they wondered, why did they elect Donald Trump? Hmm. Well, they elected Donald Trump because he told these people where to go. So you think it was the military industrial complex, the, the liberal economic order, the formation 1946 that just, just annihilated? I mean, that's what I think it is anyway. W what do you mean? Well, in 1946, after World War II, they yeah. decided we don't want World War again. We're going to set up this liberal economic order and put American military bases. Apparently, there were British military bases, a lot of them. And then the Americans took them, set up all these military bases. We're like, we're, we're the world police. But it seems like they're using the Federal Reserve to overprint military, military, more bombs, more blow up, waste Look, money. I'll, and they I'll, destroyed I'll, our economy and our will to, to live. It's not, it's, not, it's not the military that destroys our economy. It is the uh, entitlements that cannot be stopped. You know, you can't you can't vote the entitlements out without destroying them. And once the government gives you something, nobody ever gives it back. So though I view this as uh, putting a bandaid on a bandaid on a bandaid. So we get a wound in this country of some sort, like a housing crisis. And then we're like, quick, what do we do to heal this wound? We put a bandaid on it. Mass spending or welfare, pro welfare programs. And it may be a simple solution to everybody like, OK, we'll just you know, we've got it. We've got a we've got to, uh, an economic crisis. Let's give a stimulus to everybody to keep them afloat for now. Slapping a bandaid on the wound. Then a few weeks later, when the wound starts festering, they say, you better slap another bandage over that. So instead of cleaning it off, you know, taking the bandage off, cleaning the wound, putting a new bandage on, we've just stacked piles and piles of bandages on bandages. <laughs> I'm, I'm, a little, I'm a little bit, I, I see it in a, a little bit more of a sinister light. Um, 
nobody ever gives anybody anything, right? There's no such thing as a free lunch. The word yeah. free is actually not English. That doesn't actually refer to anything that exists except maybe the moon and the stars. Or, you know, the, the best things in life are free. But, but nothing is free. So when somebody gives you something, you have to ask, what's the price? When somebody gives you, you know, a free lunch, you ask, what, what are they asking for? Every time they give you something, it costs you your freedom. Oh, sure, sure, sure. But come on. That's not true in every case. I mean, Facebook's free. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. I think, and like you guys are saying, Trump's well, potty is... mouth, I think if the technocratic spy state wasn't in effect, the potty mouth may have actually, you know, brought people back to a state of sanity or at least a state where they could, they could rib each I have mixed feelings on the potty mouth. What were you going to say, Seamus? Sort of well, no, you know, you, you mentioned that uh, when something's free, someone's actually covertly taking something from you. Timcast.com is not free. So I'm That's letting you guys right. know to plug for things Actively that are free. Yeah, exactly. Take your money. We'll just take your money. <laughs> Look, not, you know, patreon.com slash freedom to isn't free either. I'm letting I, you know. I do like how the idea of Facebook being free was so absurd. Everyone yeah. laughed at the, the idea, at the idea because Facebook is so awful. Oh, that's not why. <laughs> Bro, you did, you, did you see that Mark Zuckerberg said his employees endearingly call him the eye of Sauron? <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, we're he, th he thinks that's endearing. It kind yeah, of worries me a little bit, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's uh, amazing that... Yeah. I, I that is he really there's no way he believes that, that. lack <laughs> of self-awareness I think he's <laughs> spying on everybody that he work that works for him but he thinks it's fine yeah because he he's thinks he's a intentions. nice guy yeah. he would never yeah. misuse it yeah. oh it's terrifying yeah. all right did Let's... you ever see Terminator 2 you know Miles Dyson the guy was like well if I'd known I was going to build the Terminator I'll stop right now and <laughs> I gotta give this. Uh, I gotta give this shout out and, and talk about our good friends over at the Young Turks because we have this. Uh, we have this video they posted back on February eighth, and it says Tim Pool makes the dumbest January sixth argument yet. Oh, this is just. Uh, it feels so good to. Uh, so sweet. Uh, there's, there's so much to bring up in terms of cultural politics and, and politics here that this exemplifies. I'm I'm grateful to be a part of the story. For those that aren't familiar, just to go back to our previous segment in January, I had made the point that at the Capitol, many people were let in the building by the police, that there were no barricades, they'd been torn down, and people walked up, cops were fanning them in, doors were being opened for them. How could you charge someone with trespass if they were welcomed into a building? Certainly that makes no sense, right? And so taking that out of context, some Twitter guy takes a clip of it, the Young Turks doing no research, run the clip of it while smack talking me saying I'm wrong and saying really dumb, poor legal arguments like if there's broken glass on the ground, it's trespassing. I think I think Jack may have said that where they're like, I'm just going to walk over this broken glass. And that means I'm allowed in. And it's like, it doesn't mean you're not allowed in. Broken no. glass is not a you know, trespassing sign. Like imagine going to a McDonald's and there's a, a broken window. It's like, ah, I guess I can't come into McDonald's. Someone broke the window. No, that's, that's not how it works. So they run this segment. And uh, I am proud to say now that uh, we have been absolutely vindicated, proven right. Judge issues the first outright acquittal of a defendant charged over the January, January 6th, right? We did just uh, mention this in a previous segment, but here's the best part. I tweeted how, how it started, how it's going with that clip from the Young Turks with the new article that c comes out showing this guy's been acquitted. And I said, hey, Jen, Anna, I was right. And their response is Anna responded on Twitter as if the news didn't come out. She just <laughs> repeated the exact same false premise on my argument while ignoring the fact that even her false premise. So so I said the writers are going to go to jail. The violent people go to jail. She's claiming that I'm saying the writers themselves will be acquitted because there's no signs, which is a gross exaggeration of my point. But the guy was acquitted. This is what they do. So I think it's a really great uh, um, ex ex example of what, what the culture war is. I make a, an observation based on a legal theory. We'll see what happens. I'm proven right. The Young Turks double down, ignore the facts, and just keep lying. Well, you know, it raises the philosophical question. If you've been insulted by the Young Turks, have you, in fact, been insulted? I think. <laughs> uh, but, 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 you know, this is actually, the Young Turks are just a, the small version of this. This is happening everywhere the other day. And Applebaum of the Washington Post, a, a, once a fine journalist, she was, used to be an actually good uh, writer and journalist, she was approached by a freshman from the University of Chicago who said to her, well, how do you feel now? about the fact that the Joe Biden laptop has turned out to be true after it was kicked off Twitter. It was suppressed by the news. And she said, oh, that's a boring story. I don't care about that. So I thought, well, here's a story that really does implicate the president of the United States in influence peddling. And she's bored. She's bored by that. She's you know, bored. It's they not shared, interesting. They shared bank accounts. Yeah. We've got more data from the laptop reportedly coming out soon. When she says it was a boring story, she's lying. 
But, mm-hmm. And no, no, no talk about bingo. Yeah, well, it's boring because it requires if you know glucose to change your mind. Cognitive dissonance requires a lot of energy <laughs> yeah. to override. Well, I, I don't know if you know this, but even though we know now that the information on the laptop is is true and legitimate, it wasn't true back then. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, yeah. that, that explains it. So I'm sorry. That's I'm sorry you were misinformed about this, <laughs> yeah, but it wasn't true at the time. Think about the historical record, right? So if you pull up stories from you know uh, October 2020. You will learn about Russian disinformation manipulating the United States. The, the story today now is that the laptop is true. There were opinion pieces, commentary, analysis, subsequent investigations, and this is the track record we get from the, these establishment crony shill press, be it Young Turks or otherwise. The Russiagate stories, they won awards for those things. All based on yes, lies. Pulitzer's. And now Pulitzer's. we know it's all well, fake. Well, yeah, Walter so, Duranty, Duranty won a Pulitzer for covering up the Holodomor. <laughs> so here, here's, 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 the, here's what I, I want you to imagine this. You look at a history book, and they have a timeline of the Donald Trump years. And it says, in 2016, Donald Trump colluded with Russia to do this. In 2017, Donald Trump was investigated for colluding with Russia. And then, under the premise that all of those stories are true, which make up the text of this history book, you then get to the year 2019, 2020, and it's like, well, we now know that all of the stuff was <laughs> fake. So how do we go and rewrite the historical record mm-hmm. that they fabricated? You know well, what I mean? Right. No. Well, you know, but but just just think about the the old fashioned idea of a reporter. Think about the guy with the hat, the snapping hat, and the press card. And his. I, I was a reporter. I was a small town newspaper man, and you would hang around places just to see if anything suspicious was happening. So if the councilman walked into the sheriff's office, you immediately thought. What's going on there? What is mm-hmm. happening here? So here they have a laptop that connects the president to his dishonest, you know, influence peddling son. And it's like, I'm bored. I, you know, I, what, really what else boring. is on TV? Is, you know, is, is Netflix on? Because I, you know, I don't want to. I'd, I mean, <laughs> I'd like to imagine there was a time where the laptop story would come out and every major news organization it would was. be like, guys, 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 get on this. We've got evidence of direct corruption involving a president. Yep. Instead, they were like, oh, no. How do we lie to protect him? Yeah. Well, in a weird way, Hunter's off limits. So people were absolutely vicious towards Trump's children. And what they often said is Trump's children are only successful because they had a rich dad. Well, look at Hunter Biden. He had a rich dad and he's very unsuccessful. And I'm not saying the man never dealt with struggle or hardship, but why is it that Trump's kids get their heat held to the, held to the fire on everything and Biden's kid is a crackhead and you're not even allowed to discuss it? <laughs> <laughs> you, look at you look at Don Jr., and he's like a, a prominent personality and well-adjusted figure and successful businessman. And then he's the bad one. He's the problem. Hunter Biden had to get his, what do you, what do you got, like his teeth oh, replaced his teeth. because of his crack addiction. Oh. Look, I Parmesan feel, cheese addiction. Yeah. He, no, he was <laughs> actually, sure remember. he was scooping up Parmesan cheese from he the carpet. So. Yeah. He said, he said that. so. I feel bad for the oh, guy over there. Oh, yeah. He's had a terrible life. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He and, actually and, has. But my point is more so how the media treats them. That's they, right. They, they're like, Don Jr. needs to go to prison. And I'm like, Don Jr. didn't do anything. <laughs> I'm just Hunter yeah. Biden did things we can see. And they're like, oh, shut up. I know. I, I'm going to do the most boring thing in the world and point out a double standard here between the left and the right. But just imagine Trump's kid with a crack pipe in their mouth. Oh, my being God. Crack. It would be the end. That would be it. That would be it. I think Don Jr., he tweeted... If I did half the things that Hunter Biden did, I'd be in prison. Yeah. 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 Well, no question You'd about that. You'd be in jail. If, His dad told him that. <laughs> and not, not oh, yeah. only would he be in prison, but Donald would be in prison. Oh, I mean, yeah. that's yep. the thing. The, the, con- the connection on this laptop is getting worse and worse. The stuff, you know, China has a, a very clever strategy that I think they call, what do they call it? Hunting the elites or, or elite capture, elite capture. That's yeah, what right. they call it. They obviously elite capture Joe Biden through his son. And, I, you know, is that illegal? Probably not. But, but still... I disagree. I think the elite captured Joe Biden through Joe Biden and his son was the intermediary. Well, there you go. Which is why that's, Joe, that's that's Joe Biden yeah. used Air Force Two to fly <laughs> his son to China for a private yeah. equity deal. Now, hold on. Tech, I mean, when he was talking about the big guy, he could have been referring to someone else. There could be someone <laughs> could really influential. Could, could, have been, could, have been, could have been Sonny Corleone. The, you know, big, uh, right. the big guy could be Trump. That's true. Yeah. We don't know. <laughs> have we exhausted all of our resources in investigating this yeah. yet? Yeah. Trump is a big guy. That's exactly. Yeah, Trump's bigger than Biden and Joe. Yeah, yeah. That proves it. Oh, my gosh. You're right. It's we, you know, it's 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 funny how uh, we have we have the uh, the the grooming story now. <laughs> okay, groomer, hmm. and it's just fascinating. It, it's almost like the establishment press left is it, it's they're they're it's cause and effect is so obvious and predictable. You know exactly what they're going to say, how they're going to say it, when they're going to say it. You could write their articles for them before mm-hmm. they write it, and then publish them to prove a point. But you'd be talking to nobody. You know, like I was mentioning with, with, you know, Anne and the Young Turks, even though an article comes out 
actually proving my point was correct. They act like it never happened. Just to clarify, you were saying that some of the people that went to the January 6th event were just let in and should be not necessarily charged with trespass, but then they interpreted that as you were talking about the people that were breaking windows and stuff as well. They were lying. Okay, so that mis so, and, they're, and they're doubling down on that misinterpretation? Right. Okay. Misinterpretation, willful misinformation. Because, well, I, I, I think it's fair to say perhaps that they're making it up because if they actually watched anything I said, they would have known that I've always said that the January 6th rioters should go to prison. Even in the Daily Beast smear piece against me, they quoted me saying the January 6th rioters should be in prison. So for the Young Turks to pretend like I've never, like I'm saying the opposite is ridiculous. But this, this, this is the point. When it comes to like the grooming story, when it comes to the Hunter Biden laptop, we talk about double standards all the time. This is one of the reasons why I think it's kind of pointless to give them quotes or even interact with them because you know exactly what they're going to do. They'll come out, they'll say, you are all fascists. Then you'll come out and be like, some of these people are groomers. And they'll go, <gasps> They're making up fake definitions of words now to lie and smear us. And it's like... But it's not even a fake definition. That defi I mean, if you well, say you should be able right. to have private conversations with someone else's kid about sexuality and tell them, don't tell your parents, you're grooming them. Yeah, that's and, what that even, is. and even worse, even worse on the on National Review, they're saying, well, we shouldn't say grooming. It's not technically grooming. You think like there's calling a bill, don't say gay, that has nothing to do with not saying gay. Can we not at least fight tough? Can we not at least play the game the way the game is played? I don't want to I don't want to go dirty, but if they're going to use phrases that are catchy and actually turn people against things, why can't we? This exactly. is Exactly. You know what? I don't think we should call them the National Review because I cannot believe that that article was reviewed before they published it. That's insane. <laughs> or that anybody yeah. in the nation is still listening. Right. The funny the funny thing I'm seeing now from a lot of people on the left on Facebook is they're arguing the bill in Florida that someone posted a meme where it's like, in response to this bill, I'm going to stop talking to kids about traditional marriage and heterosexuality, and I'm not going to I'm not going to use gendered pronouns. And I'm like, you are now arguing that the actual position of the conservatives is the position they don't have. You're I, I'm I'm confused. Like, you are the ones who created the narrative that it banned people talking about gay people when the conservatives never said that. It was just identity in general, and now your it's it's like they're mad at themselves there is no excuse themselves. to talk to somebody else's child in kindergarten about their sexuality there's no excuse when I, when I was a kid a cop used to come and visit you in in school and say if anybody does this call the police you know the policeman is your friend he will come and take this bad guy away now they're actually saying that there are people on tv saying you know i'm gay and now i can't talk to children about my personal life you know, how about teach, true. teach them math? How about that? But also, but, like, but, am but, I supposed but, to cry for that person? Like, oh, no. Yeah, I know. Yeah. But it's what? not even true. You can still oh, talk course. about your personal of life. Course. That's, if they, if they need to talk about personal life, they need a therapist. That, to yeah, their, yeah, to yeah, these yeah. children, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, so uh, I, I do want to jump to another story, but I'm just curious because when it comes to the media and the very obvious predictable nature of the lies and the manipulations, I'm curious your thoughts, Andrew. My, my attitude's very much been just ignored at this point because the moral universes are so disparate. Like, there's not a single sane, rational human being of, of, of cognitive faculties who is going to agree that adults should have sexual conversations with children in secret. But there's the entirety of the democratic establishment lying to maintain that. Right. I, what do you think the solution is here that, you know, how, what, what well, do we do to... I, I, think, yeah, I think you do have to speak up for the simple reason that people get afraid. They, they think that more people agree with them than do. And so, you know, I, I worked in Hollywood for a long time and I would walk into a meeting and somebody would come over to me and say... I saw you on, on Hannity last night. A whisper, I saw you on Hannity last night. And I would say, why are you whispering? We're in the right. You know, most people in the country agree with us. And the thing is, they can create an atmosphere of agreement and of being in the majority that simply isn't the case. I mean, look at the fact, look at the fact what happened with Disney was this guy, Bob Chapek. He's a conservative. He wanted to take Disney out of the politics. A minority of his employees who are LGBTQ came and yelled at him and he caved. Sounds where like, was the minor, where was the majority? Sounds like conservatives are uh, have a tendency towards cowardice. Yeah. Uh, yep. Yep. No, yeah. I was about to say he sounds like a conservative. I think yeah. humans. Yeah. I think yeah. humans yeah. tend towards cowardice. cowardice. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Humans seem to be they tend towards cowardice when they're alone. When they think that's they're alone. right. That's right. Uh, yeah. Big mm -hmm. part of it is, is like you said, speaking up so people know they're not alone. Yep. Mm -hmm. I yeah. mean, you look at what happened to Papa John. I'm not surprised these CEOs are like, I'll do it. I'll do whatever you say. Yep, absolutely. And that, that's the other thing. They're not going to get sued by, you know, angry conservatives. Papa so, John did nothing wrong. Yeah. I love that nothing. statement. Yeah. That's correct. And his pizza he was, was great. He was, uh, they'll, they'll lie and they'll, they'll cheat and they'll steal mm -hmm. and they'll manipulate. But Papa John was on a phone call and he complained about racism. 
Right. He used the word to, com he was a racial slur to complain about the slur and how someone else had used it and no one cared. And we're in a no. situation and now And they with destroyed his life, with his career YouTube over censorship laws is like if you reference a book from the past that has a, ra a word in it that's now considered racist, you're essentially, they, they, the algorithm treats it as if you're the one making the racist comment. And that's dangerous for rhetoric, for society, for free speech. Uh, I don't, you know, same thing happened to John. Yeah. And here's another thing conservatives Busted. do. They sit and defend YouTube and Facebook saying, well, they're, they're independent companies, so they can do whatever they want. You don't want the government, uh, you know, making rules about them. Well, yeah, I do. No, actually, I do. The government is there. It was instituted among men to protect our God-given rights. The First Amendment protects those rights from the government, but the government actually, its job is to protect our free speech rights. When you have things like Google, which is controlling 90% of the information flow, Amazon, which is selling 90% of the new books, they can be regulated. They can be yep. essentially regulated yeah. to make sure that everybody gets to speak. Let's yeah. let's you want to. Well, yeah, I just want to add this. It, it's kind of hilarious. We see this a lot with conservatives basically just accepting the left wing framing. So what lefties yes. will say is, yeah. "You believe in free market capitalism? Doesn't that mean you think any big business should be able to do whatever they want to at any time?" And conservatives go, "I guess you're. I guess I do believe that, sir." <laughs> and then they go off and they fail to achieve anything whenever they elect their leaders. Uh, but you look at the left and they've been sitting there for years going, oh, no, you know, it's a private business. They can do whatever they want. And then as soon as Elon Musk buys a significant share of Twitter, my goodness, we can't. <laughs> these people are too powerful. Yeah. We can't allow them to influence the public let's, discourse with their money. Let's talk about the true nature of some of these organizations. We have this story from TimCast.com. Black Lives Matter purchased $5.8 million mansion from friend who paid $3.1 million days earlier. Patrice Cullors described criticism of the purchase as racist and sexist in an Instagram post. <laughs> According to a New York Magazine report, the National Black Lives Matter group purchased a $6 million mansion in L.A. with donor funds in October 2020. BLM took measures to keep the purchase a secret. On Wednesday, Cullors responded to questions over the cash purchase of the Studio City mansion, describing them as racist and sexist. She said that the author had a proven and very public bias against uh, me and other black leaders. The expansive estate was purchased by Diane Pascal the financial manager for the LLC, Janaya and Patrice Consulting. The New York Post reported the property was purchased from televangelists Sean and Sherry Boltz on October 21st, 2020 for $3.1 million. Quote, LA County Property Assessment Records consulted by the Post show the value of the two parcels combined. It's one, one house with two buildings at $3.3 million on July 6, 2020, three months before Pascal's purchase. The value nearly doubled after the purchase of the property on January 24th, 2021. The assessment for the two parcels shot up to 5.8. Pascal told the Post he paid the asking price without elaborating further. Within, within a week of the purchase, ownership was transferred to an LLC in Delaware named after the property's address public records show. Now, I don't know exactly <laughs> if this proves anything definitively, but here's what it sounds like at the very least. There were televangelists who had a $3.3 million property. They listed it for sale. This guy buys it for the asking price, which the the, the uh, Boltzes, it was, uh, what's the guy's name? I, I want to make sure I get the, uh, Sean Boltz said was $3.1 million. About a week later, the BLM nonprofit bought it for five point eight. Where did that $2.7 million go? Right. It seems like, just seems like, seems like it went to fighting racism that and sexism. A non -profit you. <laughs> pulled a shady deal mm -hmm. to give $2.7 to launder it out of a nonprofit into private hands so it is now obfuscated and used for who knows what. I was waiting for that launder word because that's what it, it does. seems like. It does seem like. It sounds like it's just, <laughs> it's just a hint of, you know, the, I'm going to go all the way on this. First of all, this BLM is a con game all the way down. It is a con game all the way down. They tore this country apart over the death of a fentanyl addict who resisted arrest. And he, he the policing was bad in that story, but they tore the country apart. The police don't kill black people. The police are, are not prejudiced against black people. Black people commit a, an inordinate amount, let me put it another way, an inordinate amount of the crime, violent crime that is committed, is committed by people who are black. 50% of murders. I think there's a better way to put it I think it's uh, poor people, and a lot of a lot of black neighborhoods tend to be impoverished. Maybe, maybe, but the facts are the facts. If fifty percent of the country, seven percent of the country are black males. 
It's not that 7% of the country are committing 50% of the murders because it's a small number. The majority of black people, of course, are not murderers at all. It's a small number of bad guys who are black who are committing 50% of the crime. That puts police in a certain position. That means you are statistically more suspicious when you go into a neighborhood and you're black. So you get, and it's very insulting and upsetting for a stand up guy who's black to get stopped by the police for nothing. Right. But it's also upsetting for a stand up cop who's also in the majority to be accused of being uh, racist because there was a bad cop. So so all I'm saying is this is a con game from the beginning. Their open plan in the, on their website until they took it down was a Maoist plan to introduce, uh, violently introduce yep. socialism and destroy the American family and destroy, as they call it, cisgender sexuality, and they did it through riots. It's, a con, it's all and, a con and, game. And specifically on their website, targeting the family, disrupting the nuclear family. Yes. And, but uh, but yeah. I, I, I would love to actually have a deeper, like a moral discussion, because I don't, I, I think we often don't, don't go through it. Um, I mentioned poverty and you mentioned race, but right. I, I don't think you're implying that um, based on race, they're committing more crime, just that. I, I don't, I don't imply that. I don't think that's right. true at all. I think the left thinks it's true. I right. think that's why they want to get rid of uh, bail and they want to get rid of policing because they don't, they literally, the left does not think black people can rise above. And I thoroughly believe they can. So the, the, the issue I see, you know, having grown up in Chicago, having lived in New York, is that uh, I agree. I think the stats are the stats that come from right. the FBI. Um, I think it's tied to poverty. And then there's the issue of historical wealth and systemic racism. Now, often the right says, you know, there isn't systemic racism. Or we recently saw with John Stewart and Andrew Sullivan. Sullivan said, what systems, what systems? John had a terrible argument. I think Andrew performed poorly. Did you see that segment yeah. they did? Yeah. And so, so I, I would love to get your thoughts on this. You know, the way I see it is uh, crime is tied to poverty. And I think what we end up seeing with like FBI crime stats, it actually generates racist beliefs that some people believe race is the component that causes the crime. I think poverty is the component. And I think there are elements of history uh, in the United States going back to, say, the 80s. I, see, I would, I would say culture. I, I, if poverty caused crime, uh, Wall Street would be an honest place. What poverty does is it limits the kind of crime you could commit. The guy who holds right. you up in a, an alley would happily write a check and, and you know steal money from a company without risking his life. Well, then, but then he doesn't it, have that option. Is it it's violent crime? Is it violent crime, yeah. So, but, but people are sinful, they're broken, they're criminal, and, and that is going to come out everywhere. However, the culture, black culture, has been utterly destroyed, and it was destroyed by great society programs by the left. Before the Great Society, before Lyndon Johnson's Great Society, black people were moving into the middle class faster than they were afterward. They were warned, the, the Democrats were warned by a Democrat, by their own guy, that these programs would foster uh, single parent homes and destroy the black family. It used to be that 25% of black children were born out of wedlock. Now it's 75%. That's more than when Democrats were actually selling their slaves because all the slave owners were Democrats too. They were s selling their slaves down the river to purposely break up the family. It's worse now. They finally broke up the black family. When you go into a prison, a, a Democrat will tell you, oh, look, they're all black and Hispanic, therefore it must be black. They're all fatherless, every single one. You go down that that prison cell, you are looking at one fatherless child after another. It's culture. It, and it, and you people are poor and honest. Most black people who are poor are also honest. You know, they're trying to build uh, jobs. They're trying to build a life and all this. But when you have no father, when you have broken homes, when each guy has three different baby mamas and all this stuff, you are going to have more crime. And that's what's happened. This is this has only happened since the 60s, since the, you know, uh, Jason Riley, the, one of the much better writers about uh, black problems in America, had a book and it was called Please Stop Helping Us. <laughs> you oh, know? Yeah, yeah. And that's what I think the problem is. It makes me wonder about uh, the Democrats' position before civil rights and how their position after civil rights still perpetuates serious problems in the black community. Well, right, because, I mean, the, the Martin Luther King idea that you should be judged by the content of your character, not the color of your skin, has gone out the window. Let me, let me, I want to point something out. Uh, you saw in, in California they were trying to repeal the civil rights provision from their constitution. Do you remember this? Uh, because of the, uh, because of the fact that they kept them from doing affirmative action. Right. Yeah, right. And so I had a conversation with a friend who is woke, and I asked, do you know the, the demographics of California arts? Yeah, it's overwhelmingly white. I think it's like 70% white. And I said, and do you believe that there are towns in California that are 90, 99% white? Well, yes, of course. Of course there are. Do you think those towns, when this law passes, 
or when you repeal the civil rights provision, do you think they're now all of a sudden going to have an epiphany and recognize that uh, they should treat everyone equally? Or do you think that those people, because by virtue of being white, they're racist, will be racist towards black people with impunity because you've repealed the protections? Uh, huh. uh, good question. Uh, right. Yeah. I, I, so, but, but, you know, but, but my point there, I, I'm sorry, just is yeah. stop helping people, right? That's the point. They, they, they say, we're going to help you with these, these things, and they take away a provision that was fought long and hard for, civil right. rights. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and look at the way look at the way Democrats, the left, let's say, talk about black people. They say, well, we want more black people in school, so we in college, so we've got to lower the standards. And you think, really? How about raising the educational level of your the crappy schools in their neighborhoods? What would that be like? You know? Or well, giving them this, school choice. Oh, so they can well, decide where right. to send their kids and to school and instead Obama of just gutted that. Yes, the yeah. Democrats continually got that. But this is the problem, you know, when it comes to we have a we have a lot of problems. You know, giving my I'll give you my perspective from Chicago. Racial segregation is the norm in Chicago, yep. mostly by choice, but still the remnants of blockbusting and redlining. So redlining is when they said, you know, that the real estate companies or whatever, they would draw out areas where they're like, we'll only move certain people of certain races, you know, black people in these areas near the red line. And so you end up with enclaves. There's actually, uh, where I grew up, 47th Street, 47 South. When you cross it to the north, it becomes an entirely black community. To the south, it's fairly mixed, a lot of Polish immigrants. And what happens is the remnants of those uh, policies result in people wanting to move into areas where there's people of their own community. So it keeps segregation fairly entrenched. But then you also have laws that were passed that seemingly do the same thing. I've, I've talked about how they had a, a Latino elotes carts, the corn with the mayo and stuff. And they wouldn't let them come to our neighborhood. They passed a, a, a law or whatever banning them from crossing, crossing one street. Just so happens that one street, once you cross it, all the ads are in Spanish. Mm. So I, I think you've got in Chicago a very serious Democrat problem. I personally think that they thrive on racism. I absolutely yeah, I agree. They, I totally they, agree. Yeah. They make it worse because they can weaponize it to win elections. Yeah. You end up with Chicago being run by Democrats for what now, 100 years with, with what, how many improvements have, have come? It's only gotten worse. It's only gotten worse. It's yeah. only gotten worse. But you know, what, if, if, if I may just, um, people like to gather with their own. This, this country, we, we forget what a revolutionary experiment this country is. What Andrew Sullivan said to John Stewart was exactly right. I lived out of this country for seven years. This is the least racist country on earth. That doesn't mean it's not racist. That doesn't mean there aren't racists. That doesn't mean there aren't systems in place that can be uh, reformed. But this is the only country in the world f- since Rome, since the Roman Empire, where we say, if you come over, you are an American. You come here, you're an American. Doesn't matter what you look like, doesn't matter where you come from. If you look at who is most successful in American, I think in America, I think it's Indian Americans. Certainly Chinese Americans are successful. So it's not color, it's not skin color that's keeping people down. This country is amazing in its ethnic diversity. And when you leave places like L.A. and Chicago that are so largely segregated, like I'm living in a place now where there are plenty of middle class black people, the couples are all mixed and all this stuff. And you think like, yeah, this is what America does. It has always done it. There's a special problem with black people, which is that they everybody else came here to escape the oppression they alone were oppressed here. And that is a huge difference. It takes a certain amount of grace to forgive a country for doing that to you. I think they're going to have to exercise that grace because it's the only thing that's going to free them from anger in the past. But it's a tough thing to ask for. I think I think the solution is simple, and a lot of these woke people don't want to accept it. If we've already passed laws, out, uh, out, we've outlawed blockbusting and redlining and mm-hmm. other racist, right. overtly racist policies, then the solution at this point becomes class-based. If, you, if, if the left believes that the black community is disproportionately affected by historical racism and they're impoverished because of it, lack of generational wealth, then instead of making race in the law, you just say we're going to provide tax benefits, tax credits to certain families at certain levels, which we do, and then you will disproportionately benefit black families or uh, but you, you, know. you got to talk about the culture too this is the thing that gets me about conservatives here this bothers me about conservatives everybody knows in america and this is still true to this day if you get married before you have children if you go to high school if you graduate high school and then get married and then have children you probably won't be poor that's that's yeah. just the, yeah. the stats however however if you grow up without a dad if your mom is addicted to drugs you know it's a little harder to do that. You know, it's, this is the thing that conservatives forget about. Like, it may be a little tougher. It's, it's easier to do that when you grow up in the suburbs and you've seen it done. You know, white kids listen to rap than hip-hop, which I, 
I'm sorry, I think is garbage, but white kids listen to it ironically. Black kids listen to it and it actually affects the way they live and their culture. If we don't- if White we don't, kids like rap, dude, come on. No, they like it, but they but they listen to it ironically. They no. don't think, oh yes they do, because they, they go home and they see, oh my, my mom and dad like each other. They're not beating yeah, up hoes and you know. But there's white people in, in, in these neighborhoods. I grew up from the South Side I, of Chicago. I, Everyone listened to rap. I understand what little, we're talking about. white kids listen to Master P. I understand that, but we're talking about- They weren't we're, coming home to good moms. Like my, my friend's mom was a heroin addict. I, I understand, but Again, we're talking about generality and statistics, right? We're, ta- we're not talking about the, the people who do that. We're saying there is this problem of crime in black communities that it's not in white communities. I think you're talking about class, actually, because you're talking about South Side Chicago, and it's the same as what you're talking about in the black community. So maybe it's just a, a, it's a community issue. I think the skin color is a false flag, that the consciousness of these people that are like the great-grandchildren of slaves or great-grandchildren are still poor and so they're doing crime and then because you see their skin color you're like well it's the black skin color that's well, I, well, I agree saying, with that. I mean, saying, I, that's, well, but at the same time, you have these left-wing I, activists who make it all about the skin color, right. and as a result of that, they forward policies that actually do end Big up mistake. keeping the group down as a whole. I would hang out, like I lived in LA, and it was real multicultural. I went down and lived on Normal Avenue, you know, with a Mexican community, and I would I would think words to people instead of speak because I didn't speak the language, and it was I could integrate really nicely. And I understand what you're saying that there's a the black community. I, I sometimes I push back on this because I want to believe that we're all one community as a, as a species. But it's it's a it's like a lot of hugging, cooking, home home meal made meals, a lot of calling your mom on the phone. Like that's not in the white. It wasn't really part of my community growing up. I mean, my mom wanted us to have dinner together, but it wasn't that like hugging love that I sensed in that community. Mm-hmm. Um, so maybe I, I well, can see that they well, are. Well, you know, a lot of the stories. a lot of these problems exist. For instance, in what they now call hillbilly communities. And so because it's the same thing, it's the same broken culture and it's the same poverty, except they're white. So it's it's definitely not skin color. It's definitely not about skin color, but it is about cultures that do tend to accrue in groups of people. Right. So, you know, if I put if I put took 100 people and put them in a space capsule, they would instantly become a new race. Right. Because they'd sleep with each other and they would just their children would be related and whatever happened to them would affect them. So it is culture. But because people tend to gather together with their kind and sometimes, as you say, are forced to gather together with their kind, those cultures are going to look like a, cer- let's a certain Let's clarify way. that music point. You're, you're specifically ref- you're referring to like the gangsta culture music, right. not rap as, as music. No, because, I, I hate it as music, but but still, <laughs> but that's my personal opinion. Man, you know, I, see, I don't understand that. I think rap's great. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> ben also he said like rap. It's not music, okay, folks. I remember that. There's a huge controversy. I like, I like it's, not, it's not even music. I, okay, I'm, I'm, don't like, even come what, at me with that. This is, I, yo, this is like, like I'm, I feel like I'm when, home. When I, walk, when I walk down the street, when I walk down the street with my boombox, I'm playing classical music. Okay, none of that hip hop. Have you heard "Handlebars" by Flowbots? No, and I'm not going to. You are gonna. You're gonna love it. You're absolutely gonna. Yeah, it's 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 basically telling the story of. Uh, someone growing up and then eventually becoming a despot. You know, I, I was in a an Uber, uh, go, going and coming, one direction being driven by a guy, one by a girl. Both ways they were singing, they were playing on the radio the same song, right? The same. Uh, I don't. I don't know if it's hip hop or rap, whatever it was. And the story was about a, a, a woman being forced to perform uh, fellatio, and while they laughed at her, and it was. I just wanted to say, like, you know, this is degrading. It's degrading to listen but to. But that's not indicative of rap. That's indicative of a certain kind of music, Gangster like a certain, rap. a certain, a certain. It's indicative of a certain artist themselves. You know what I mean? But if you have a but like, if look you at listen, Madonna. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm on my knees praying or whatever. Yeah, yeah. But if you have a, all I'm saying is, if you're listening to that song and you have a mom and dad who treat each other nicely, that doesn't mean that much. It's ironic. It's kind of, it's like watching, it's like me watching a gangster movie. I love gangster movies. I'm never going to go out and kneecap somebody, you know. But if you are growing up in a in a dysfunctional house or a dysfunctional culture, a dysfunctional neighborhood, and you're listening to that, it may well become your standard for how you treat women. I think you know, from where I grew up. The, the neighborhood I was in was was very like very multiracial, and uh-huh. that was a lot of the music everyone listened to. Yeah. So people weren't going home to a mom and dad who were like you know dancing on date night. We, they were going home to broken homes. So how how were the outcomes in that, uh, that neighborhood? I, I mean, I've had a couple of friends of mine who were white die of heroin overdoses. They almost all were in gangs, and they were white. They're all still very poor, and their lives are. But, some some people have I rest found my middle case. class <laughs> middle class living. Yeah. Oh, definitely cultural issues for sure. Yeah. And that's that's I think we we definitely agree on that one. My my whole thing is just like rap music 
is not all, you know, just talking about beating women and doing awful things and shooting people up. Like there's rap music that's very like thoughtful, thought provoking and modest and Yahoo, for this instance. Is, this is this good. is the only subject on which I'm probably more conservative than Ben, so I, I probably shouldn't get into this. <laughs> you know, but, well, but, I think but you but made you were, a great point about the but, brainwashing power of media. It's but, massive. Let me, let me, it's massive. And we're yeah. on a new in a new environment, a new uh, uh, horizon. And, and, but, and it interacts yeah. with culture because again, yeah. you know, I can play a violent video game. It's not going to mean a thing to me. But if you're playing it for twelve hours a day and nobody's taking care of you, it actually does. But just 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 to clarify, when you're referring to rap, are you referring to about the content of the songs, what well, they depict? Well, uh, I, I would also I also think the music is is simplistic, but I think rock music is simplistic too. So I'm not the right person to talk to. But oh, I yeah. do think the degraded lyrics are, are a problem but so, so that's just an issue of particular artists like I mean there's 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 rock music that's also sim simplistic trash too you know with bad lyrics I agree <laughs> I, yes, yeah. no, I haven't liked the song since like 1500 you know when it comes to hip-hop I, 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 I like, like melody well, it's melody, vocal melody. That's what I'm missing with yeah. hip hop. Why yeah. I don't ever get into it, really. You know, I, I have to tell you, this is absolutely. My father was a, a fairly famous New York DJ, and he played what was called then middle of the road music, which is now called the American Songbook. So as a little kid, I grew up listening to Frank Sinatra and Cole Porter, Gershwin, and all this stuff. One day, my father, who knew music really well, came home and said, This new thing has come out. It's amazing. This band out of Britain called the Beatles. And he played it for me. And I was like, What? Eight years old, you know? Wow. And I, and I said, <laughs> Are you kidding me? She loves you. Yeah, yeah. You're going to trade Cole Porter for that? And he said, no, no, this is the new thing. <laughs> I'm talking to like a 50-year-old yeah. man. You know, so I, I just stayed where I was. I went through the entire 60s listening to Sinatra. <laughs> so, I got I to gotta tell you, I agree. Um, I listen to music on the radio sometimes, like, well, now it's streaming services, no. autoplay. And I'm just like, this song has no meaning behind it at all. Right. It's just, but, you know, take a look at um, Nirvana, Smells Like Teen, uh, teen Spirit. This song is mostly gibberish. Uh -huh. yeah. mm -hmm. I find a lot of rock. I found even a lot of, I mean, I, I actually kind of like the Beatles, but I found a lot of their songs incomprehensible. I've got two songs to Have show you. Have you taken LSD? That'll help. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I've, I'm got, sure. I've got two songs for you. We'll, we'll, we'll show you. Um, one's rap, one's not. We'll show you after the show. All right, all right. You know, but, uh, and but, it is mandatory. You will hold <laughs> you down. And get, you know, no, I'm it? sorry. I can't and you have to watch <laughs> Star Trek. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah, we already did that to Michael Malice. He is absolutely required. <laughs> I love Star Trek. Michael no. Malice didn't like it. Sometimes in hip-hop, you get like when they're talking like this, you hear like the melody and the tone. You can kind of derive a melody out of that. Like the voice goes up and down when they're making their sound. And you're like, oh, do you I like uh, singing? Do you like Charlie Daniels band? Yeah. Devil went down to Georgia. Yeah. Oh yeah. Best songs song. ever. I love written. that song. Yeah. I saw a funny tweet. It said, "When I was little, I thought that the Devil and his Demon band sounded better than you know Johnny, and I felt bad about it." <laughs> and I'm like, "But anyone who objectively listens it's to Catholic that song guilt, knows that the Demon band." section of the song does sound that way was, better the baseline the, the, the nah, person nah, who started nah, the Salvation nah, Army that's what he said why should the devil get all the best tunes that was one of the great lines that song's so good <laughs> I love that song Devil Went Down to Georgia I mean I love the future I'm a joke where it's like wouldn't a solid, solid gold fiddle weigh <laughs> you know, be, uh, be heavy and sound crummy <laughs> and yeah, sound lousy yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's, let's talk about this story too because well, we, we I, I want to mention one thing really quickly about this story because we strayed from a bit but I just wanted to make a quick point uh, I think it is poetically beautiful that the house was purchased from televangelists because yes. BLM, they are the <laughs> yes. exact same thing. <laughs> it is a modern iteration. They're the holy people who everyone knows are grifters and hacks and every normal person rolls their eyes at, but for some reason have esteem and legitimacy because they claim to be fighting for a good cause. Let me, let me pull up this story because I think regular people are waking up. The narrative is breaking. From TimCast.com, Pennsylvania Republicans increase voter registration, shrinking gap in predominantly Democrat state. Mm. For every Republican voter who has registered as a Democrat, four former Democrats have become wow. Republicans. Wow. 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 Four times as many, switching the other direction. I want to. I always give a shout out to Scott Pressler. Are you familiar with Scott Pressler? Oh, not really. The no. persistence on Twitter. This guy's been going out and registering oh, people the to vote. Yes. yes, all over the place. He was cleaning up cities. Now this is a guy who gets you know gets you know, he does the work. And partly uh, due to his work, and uh, truth be told, there's many other activists who are working towards voter registration as well. We're now starting to see the tides shift. I don't think the Republican Party will be the salvation of anybody unless people vote in the primaries. Mm -hmm. And they do kind of what we're seeing up in New Hampshire with the Free State Project. You see that? Mm -hmm. Getting a bunch of, you know, populist, America first, libertarian minded people to run. And then we're going to see some positive changes. But this is massive. And, and again, it's indicative of people saying we've had enough. The economy's in the gutter. We don't like Joe Biden. It's been a year, and already we're seeing this massive shift. 
And it's also people snapping out of the media narrative. I want to show you one thing before we all start diving into this. Take a look at this from the generic congressional vote 2022. Republicans have a lead of 3.6 points. So we're, we're still a bit uh, a bit out. Take a look at 2020. The Democrats had the lead in the generic congressional polling aggregate the entire time, ending with a 6.8 lead. And Republicans still made powerful gains, especially in Democrat strongholds. Yeah. What are we going to see in November? It's going well, to be, it's going well, to be this, no, this November is going to be a wipeout, I think, and unless the only thing that could stop it and it's not going to happen is Joe Biden basically saying, uh, well, you know, I think the environment matters, but the new Green Deal is finished. You know, if he actually turns against the left, because remember, like Obama, Biden ran as a centrist. That was the whole point of Joe Biden. And, you know, one thing people forget about Obama, he was a very popular guy, obviously a very charismatic and kind of likable guy, and, and people liked him. Every Democrat except him was voted out of office during his term right, of office. Right. right there was like two. There was like two Democrats still working. The rest of them were, you know, at a malt shop somewhere. So, so the, people do not like these programs. But you saw, you saw the State of the Union with Biden, right? Yeah. It was, it was sort of the we're still hoping to do things of the union. Yes. Because this you never really Come mentioned. Come on, that. man. What's the State of the Union? Come on. Campaign but, speech. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, he, 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 he talks about border security. He says, "I'm a capitalist." He was, he was just stealing. Oh, he said, actually, refund. Fund the police. That's right. Fund the yes, police. he did. And he said we need to secure the border. He's he's he's, he's, he's trying to play both sides. Cancer, too, so we're going yeah, to build cure cancer. Oh, <laughs> Michael Chips in the field of dreams. Man. How, I mean, how stupid does he think? Well, I guess uh, I yeah. guess we it, it answers, to them, uh, answers uh, itself. Yeah, yeah. People switching parties is proof that people are not stupid. They're yep, waking up and right. they realize Joe Biden is spitting uh, in their faces. Uh, I, I agree. And I, I don't even I don't even know. Is Joe Biden running the country? I mean, I have no idea. But whoever is, I mean, really. The AOC, Bernie Sanders wing of the party is completely in control. They believe, as AOC just said on the air, she said, we've got to be more uh, left wing because, uh, you know, let them. Let them. That's the way I feel, too. Yeah, go for it. I think go it's the it. bankers it's, that are controlling the country. I saw an Andrew Jackson quote from 1830 where he yeah. called the bankers a, nest, a den of vipers. <laughs> and then they, he was attempted. They tried to kill him. They shot Somebody shot him. To, to and an he ex- broke I, up the central bank. I, I agree uh, to a certain degree, right? Obviously, the Federal Reserve, you know, we all have our problems with. But uh, I think what happened to the Democrats is they saw AOC and the, and the rise of the progressives, and they thought, we can wield this power. But little did they realize it was like the one ring and they would not be able to. Yeah, that's right. Well, Biden has always followed the uh, drift of his party. During Clinton, uh, he was kind of conservative. I mean, he wrote the the uh, cr- anti-crime bill, crime bill that everybody's right. complaining about. You know, so he always has followed the drift of his party. He is, he, you know, <laughs> they call it leading from behind. I mean, it's mm. leading from your ass, basically. But I mean, <laughs> but, I mean, he has always followed what where the power in his party is. And right now, the energy, the power in his party is from on the left, but not the majority. I mean, he follows the party so closely, like he literally steals their backstories when he talks about himself. Why am I the first Biden to not work in a coal mine? The first Biden. Yeah. Well, you got you got you you do got to give Joe Biden credit for for one thing. He he's brought a few things to the White House that we've not seen any president bring before. And it's Batacaf care, next Nelrescent, and Trinidad Shabbat. Trinidad Shabbat. Shabbat. I, I really appreciate the Trinidad Shabbat pressure that he placed on uh, game changer. Putin. Uh, game that changer. He placed on Putin. Trinidad Shabbat pressure, man. I, I have to say, you guys do that really well. I can't imitate that. It's, it's, like, it's, it's, another, it's like another Honestly, language. Honestly, it's you know? probably to your credit that you can't. <laughs> next Nelrescent. Next Nelrescent. Batacaf care. Those are easy. But Trinidad and a shot of pressure. Trinidad and a shot of pressure. That By the way, we uh, Trinidad and a shot of pressure. We turned it into a song and made it a cartoon called Biden's Greatest Hits. You guys better go check oh, that good. out. Someone <laughs> said it's true in Dash shot of the pressure. Yeah. And no, I, I do see how you might hear that. But I, I listened to that over and over again on re- a repeat, trying to transcribe yeah. what he said to figure it out. Trinidad and a shot of pressure. Yeah, the double in and a. Yeah, the Trinidad and a nesh. True in and a nesh. Shot of pressure. True international. Something under pressure. There I think that's go. what he was attempting. Very True good. international cooperation. Well, cooperation. Like, the, like the Biden so, whisper. Yeah, yeah, well, we've, been, we've, we've <laughs> talked about it before. Can't yeah, he does credit. that little whisper. It's yeah. very yeah. bizarre. You know what concerns me about him going with the flow is like that this, uh, this weird kind of, I don't know how to describe it, this movement of like left, uh, le- this communist ideologies that are kind of creeping. It seems like he's giving it to them. Like he's just letting it happen because he feels like that's where the pressure is coming from. Is these, we got to do what the young people want, man. I don't know what... <laughs> What he's why, but it, it seems like he's just folding. Somebody to it. told him, or he told himself, that with a 50 50 split in Congress, in the Senate certainly, but really across the board, he was going to become FDR. 
And that's just not the way politics works. It's not the way American politics work. He does not have the votes to do the things that he wanted to do, and people didn't want them done. Joe Manchin, you know, it's funny. Joe Manchin actually represents a more popular point of view than AOC does. I mean, if you just mm. count counted people who agreed, checked off what he, Manchin believes in, they would follow him. But AOC is more popular because she's pretty? She's popular to the press. And she's popular. You know, remember, I, she's in a safe she district. Knows how to get I, she's, I really, she's in a safe district. I really it, turned off by how people follow beautiful people. It's really disgusting. I, well, it, it, well, Welcome to life, bro. Yeah. People it's don't just, want... It's so it dangerous. We got to fix that as a species. So are, you, are you saying you hate my fans? <laughs> uh, well, I'm not saying you're beautiful, if that's what you're asking. <laughs> I was gonna, Your fans I was, are the beautiful. I was going to do a similar joke, but I was going to say, uh, uh, Ian, would you give up all your followers then? <laughs> I was going to say it too, but I was yes. like, you know what? It would be a bad look to compliment Ian. I'll compliment myself. We're all going to die eventually. You see the story that... AOC, uh, the FEC says you, that though. they failed to report a million dollars in, in expenses. That it, it seems that they were funneling money, dark money, between two different organizations run by Saket Chakrabarty. Yeah, it sounds is, like a racist, sexist thing to say. Yeah, this, is, this is to me the fascinating thing. And I don't hear anybody talking about this. All these socialists are supported by the rich. And I, I don't. I wonder, does AOC ever wake up in, like in the middle of the night and think, why are the biggest corporations on earth agreeing with me? I'm a socialist. I, I mean to take their property away why are they agreeing with me or does she know that socialism always serves the rich and the powerful? she seemed to change about a year and a half ago something snapped in her brain and now huh. she like uh, believes I, I, this weird she's like on board with that thing it feels like it something remember, changed remember, in her rhetoric power yeah. do you guys ever see the episode of simpsons where someone asks homer to listen and he says you have my undivided attention and then it zooms into his brain and it's a it's a, it's playing the monkey with the symbols right no or, no, or, it's or, a, no it's an old a, cartoon with yeah, the cow and it's a turtle's a... banging on his <laughs> chest like do, 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 do. i kind of imagine that when i see her like doing interviews or talking because she's she said things and that that are so absurd you'd think she doesn't have access to a dictionary or google yeah like when she talked about capitalism she was like no one's a capitalist because they're not rich. It's like those things don't don't connect. What are you talking? What are you talking about? <laughs> you did know you what? Google that. Did you Google that before you said it? Another one of her greatest hits is when she was complaining about the fact that people say that universal health care is going to cost a lot of money, and she said, "Well, why don't people talk about all the money we're going to save when we don't have to pay for as many funerals?" Yeah. It's like, do you think people stop dying if we have or no, they eat more or, sugar because you keep more Remember Amazon? What, or no? What oh, was the, she what? said she saved money. Uh, yeah, and it was her like, district because Amazon didn't move there. They're like, yes. why are they giving money to Amazon? It's, it, they're not. They're giving them a discount on the taxes they would pay. <laughs> like, so the thirty billion dollars the city would get, and the jobs. 20, right, 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 right. So it's like Amazon would instead would would pay twenty seven billion instead of thirty billion because they're getting a three billion discount. And she's like, but why are we giving them three billion dollars? But here's the thing: so they don't, that's, so they don't go to national. Exactly, we're not. They're paying <laughs> us. But that's actually so. Economics? So, that, and I'm gonna be honest: that's not opportunity just, cost. That's is not is um, is for as many problems as there are with AOC's thinking, socialism being one of them. That's not a unique flaw with their thinking. That's just part of the socialist ethos. This business is only here exploiting and taking advantage of our workers. The only way we benefit from them being there is by taking taking their money involuntarily. So from, from their perspective, they really did lose money on that, as absurd as that sounds. <laughs> but they were either way going to take money from Amazon, just a little bit less. But they so, don't but see it that way because Amazon was going to come there and exploit their workers. Right. Yeah, Socialists never yeah. ask themselves where the money comes from. Yeah, I, I, love, I love going on these posts I'll see on Facebook where it's like, uh, uh, they say landlord isn't a real job or they say wage labor is theft. And so I asked a few of these socialists some questions I was like, what if the people who rent my property are paying less than the cost of maintaining and upkeeping the property? Is that theft? And they're like, that makes no sense. And I'm like, what do you mean? Like, sometimes people rent out a property and it will cost more than That's the true. amount they're paying in rent. So who's being robbed now? Yeah. There's like no, no good answer. I said, what if I'm paying the employee more money than they generate for the company? Is that theft? And they're like, That's not possible. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, it's called investment. Mm -hmm. Like you can invest all the in a project that's making no money, but you're hoping to make money in the long term. So you're giving your money to somebody who's making no money for you in the hopes they eventually will. And then you'll get paid back. Right. They're like, well, then you're an idiot. That, that, that's literally <laughs> what I was told on Facebook. Well, that's like, that's like when they d women demand equal pay for the same sport. And you go like, nobody's watching the sport. Nobody's yeah. watching women's sports. You know, it's just like they will now that men are playing them, but, but still, <laughs> exactly. you know, <laughs> and, and you know, you, you get paid the money that you bring in. I was, uh, uh, I actually knew the people who got uh, the, at the X Games, they used to pay women 10% of what the men got paid. 
And so this is the story as it was told to me. Because I actually ended up going to the X Games as like a, a, an advisor, a liaison or whatever with one of these organizations. So uh, a good friend of mine was one of the top female skateboarding pros uh, for a while. And what I was told by these people, at the X Games, they would give, I think it was like $30,000 to the first place male winner. And the first place female winner would get $3,000. And when this group of, you know, uh, parents and organizers went to Disney, to ESPN or whatever, whoever runs it, said, you're paying women 10%. Like, that's not fair. And they said, look at the stands. How many people are there watching? You guys, you don't sell any tickets. We can't pay you money we don't have. Well, after some clever negotiating and some good PR tactics, eventually they agreed, we're going to pay the same. What the argument was from the organizers is, we have the best female skateboarders in the world. If you can't sell tickets, you have a marketing problem. Huh. And so they said, you're going to pay the same you're going to pay. And so eventually they agreed. There's a really interesting backstory behind it. I don't know if it's public, so I'll, I'll, I'll refrain. But uh, uh, that was their mentality. I think there's a decent point there, to be honest. Well, no, it, well if, if there is well, a point if, there. If, if, if you're going to invest in, in, in a show and you're saying the going rate for the top athletes in a division is X, you're investing, hoping that you can figure out how to monetize it. If you if you want top athletes, and you're you and and you can't figure out how to sell those top athletes, then then I'd argue get rid of the division out, outright instead of just being like. Well, that that certainly would have been one answer, but I don't understand. I mean, it may be there's just less demand. Yeah, exactly. I mean, mm -hmm. if it's a problem with marketing, why don't these female skateboarders get together, rent a stadium, hire a competent marketer, and make just as much money as the men? Well, that would require tens of millions of dollars in investment they didn't have. Potentially, but they could start smaller and they'd still be generating more income than this business that is just failing to market them. When you properly. come to performance-based jobs, you got to pay people based on their performance. And if the girls can't jump as high, sorry, you, you it's not you're not performing look, as well. But in look that at women's tennis. Women's tennis makes a ton of money. Be but be that's because women's tennis is almost a different game. I, I love tennis, and women's tennis is a almost a different game, and, and in some ways a better game because it's slower and you can see it. More. Oh, that's a good point. So, so it brings and and they wear those cute little dresses. So I mean, like, <laughs> you know, it brings people in. You know, yeah. it, no, but that's it is. but that's that's yeah, that's structure 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 marketing, marketing, right? right? Everything, everything. I I never liked the Williams sisters, not because any personal animus, but they were so strong that they kind of overwhelmed people. Because I always liked the slower women's game because it's just more strategic and more interesting. The the vol the rallies last longer. Uh, it's it's just more fun. So it, so it makes money. You women's know? volleyball so, too. So I've always had. I've always this loved is interesting. That. I don't know. I don't so uh, the guy who actually led the charge for women's tennis in the 80s is the same guy who was leading the same charge mm -hmm. for women's skateboarding. Uh -huh. So I, I think, I think there's, a, there's, there's still an, a, an agreement there. I think perhaps they need to create a different structure and stop trying to just replicate men's with women and maybe make something different. Well, I, I'm more all for that. I think that mm -hmm. that is one of the big mistakes of feminism is they're always trying to make the women men, even in, in, in how they live their lives, like women start their careers early in, because of the feminists say their careers are important. I think, why not have the babies early and then have mm. your career afterwards? It makes a lot more sense. So just because men do it one way doesn't mean women have to do it the same way. Well, I'll tell you, man, uh, there's this woman I know. She had a kid when she was in her mid-20s. So this is what, what, what she told me. Her and this guy were both doing the same kind of work. They were working in um, like media production. She ends up having a kid and took off only a little bit of time to, you know, take maternity time off mm -hmm. and then raise the kid. But it, it it disproportionately held her back because there's an exponential gain to working nonstop when you're young. And so, you know, she was pointing out that she's now in her 30s and she's half the distance of the guy who never took any time off. Sure. But that, that, that said, I, I said to that, I'm like, I don't know if there's any solution to that because women literally have babies and men don't. Uh, yes, and, and also maybe she got something else that men didn't have and she, maybe she had a life that she liked better. You know, she got yeah. to have a kid yeah. and spend time with her kid and that other guy did. It's a nice thing. Yeah. I think that's the crazy thing about it that right now, you know, we're telling young girls to be men, yep. to, to adopt the masculine role. And we're, we're, we're sort of ignoring the fact that having kids is a magical thing. It's, it's right. beautiful. It's wonderful. And people take it for granted. And I hate how it's viewed as some sort of consolation prize. Oh, you didn't have a career, but you get to have a kid. As if your career is going to be more meaningful than creating human life. <laughs> there are so many people who are infertile who would love to be able yeah. 
to have a child and they can't well there and we we constantly refer to this as something that we can just take for granted in fact we view it as a demeaning thing oh you think that i should just have children or you think this person or these people should just be having kids like what do you mean just be yeah. having kids <laughs> let's like the most incredible thing a person can do let's trigger the entirety of the uh let's put the overwhelming majority of millennial democrat women that's what i'm how here many, for how many yes. women uh millennial women do you think secretly would prefer to be stay-at-home mothers with children I can I can answer this question. Most of them. Yes, but I can I can answer it experientially. I I lived for many years in uh, a place called Montecito, which is in Santa Barbara, possibly one of the wealthiest communities on earth. All of the women stayed home. Why? Because they could. You know, I mean, that was it. They had a, they had a complete choice. And people always ask me, well, why do you talk about the rich? And I say because they have complete choice. You know, they don't have. To, they could have worked. And and I'll tell you something else, by the way. Just they were. They called them the Montecito moms. They ran everything. They ran the town. They were. I, I, I was a tennis player. I was in locker rooms where guys will say obnoxious things. I never heard a man diss his wife, not once. I never heard them spoken of with any with anything with like kind of awe and respect because they built not just a, a home life, but they built. It's not just having the children; it's creating souls out of those with those children. It's it's an, a remarkable thing, and those women actually were you know at the center of the of the city the education and formation of children it's so unbelievably important yep. and it's this power that stay-at-home mothers have that they've been told to reject and you're right that they also serve a very important function in the community and it's not as if when they leave to have corporate careers that is filled by someone else or a different group of people it just either isn't done at the same level or not at all yeah feminists took the brags of men seriously men were like we're more important than women you know? <laughs> I know. Feminists said, what you know we want to <laughs> don't they know how much we lie I mean, yeah. <laughs> and, now, and now all these Nobody years tell. later, you've got men just sitting at home playing video games while the women are out there making the money like she bought it, dude. That's great, yeah. So this is, this is, Of course, I'm being facetious. Everyone's miserable. <laughs> so I just did a quick Google search. This is interesting. In, in uh, 2015, Time reported Gallup said 56% of U.S. mothers, uh, well, I don't know what they're actually saying. Maybe this is wrong. It said, who prefer to stay home over work? If that's what, if, I hope that's the correct context. It's But in 2019, it says... Gallup says record high 56% of U.S. women prefer working Oof. to homemaking. Doubt. Now, but this is the reason why I said really, because there's social stigma involved. And, um, you know, far be it for me to say that these women are lying to polls in secret. But we also know about the secret Trump voter, that many Trump voters lied to pollsters out of fear or just distrust. I'm curious if there's a similar effect with women who would prefer to be at home with kids or well, if they really would just rather be working. Well, the studies do show that women have gotten increasingly unhappy. Mm. Uh, they used to be far happier than men. They used to be both far happier and far less happy than men because women have a wider emotional range. Uh, but now they're just un more unhappy than men. I think a lot of it's like the birth control and the water supply and stuff, these chemical these chemicals, man, I don't know if it's chemical castration, but it's like changing moods. Uh, you, you know, well, we do you have, the challenges. have more estrogen. Our men have you, less testosterone now than they did decades ago. It's microplastics in the water. You can, find this, a, dude. you can find a poll for anything. Yeah. So yeah. here we go. Here's a poll. Poll finds most working moms would rather stay home. Okay. Well. Yeah. So Gallup says the opposite. There's time differences. Yeah, like it's really pull, hard to know. If you pull Montecito, oh. you're going to get 98% of women want to stay home. How but, many people did right. they pull? 2,000? You know, we got to figure that out. All I know is I, when I was before the pandemic, when I was giving a lot of speeches at colleges, I, I used to start my speech by saying, listen, I'm an old guy. I'm, I'm going to tell you what I see. Young women are miserable. Hmm. When I finish my speech, if I'm wrong, get up and tell me. Don't be afraid. Just come up and tell, tell me you're not miserable. You love what's going on. Never, not once, yeah. did a woman get up and say, we're not miserable. In fact, they often got up and said, oh boy, are we. It feels mm -hmm. like if someone, if people are losing hope for the future, that the women are going to feel it the, the hardest. No, I think it's a good point. Partly because like you were saying, they have a stronger emotional range just yeah. in general, being female um, for but, the, is a generalization. But they're also but like, the creators of the yeah, future. Yeah, they yeah. are the one, the anchor of reality. And they, they see this nonsense of these dudes screwing around with each other, making war and, and just like ignoring you know, clean water supplies, like sustainable technology in the future. Like, oh man. This is, I, I have to mention my book, The Truth and Beauty, because I want everybody to buy it. But this is one of the chapters in the book is about the uh, novel Frankenstein, yes. which I argue is about a man usurping the power of women. Mm. That they, they frequently said, and Mary Shelley, the author, actually said it's about a man usurping the power of God. And I thought, no, he's not, because men and women can make life. You know, they make life out of given material. But what he does is he makes a person without a, 
a mother. Yes. And that's the whole story. And they, by the end of it, the monster, as they now call him, the monster says, says, make me a woman. You know, make, make a woman for me. Make me an Eve. You made an Adam, now make an Eve. And when he won't do it, the guy becomes a, a serial killer, basically. He just kills every woman he can find. And that's, uh, you know, that is a very powerful expression. That, that theme, you know, that was the first modern science fiction novel. She yeah. invented, she was 18 years old, 19 years old when she wrote it. She invented the genre of science fiction. And that's what science fiction a lot of times is about. So if you look at Brave New World, you know, what happens? They get rid of mothers and they just make babies in machines. If you mm -hmm. look at The Giver, uh, you know, they relegate motherhood to the lowest person. Yeah. My favorite example is The Terminator, <laughs> which is one of my no it's, it's actually a great action film the I'm first not the it. first one is one of the great action the machines have taken over the world human beings are trying to fight back so what do they do they send somebody back in time to kill the rebel leader's mother mm -hmm. you know and and if you in the first movie the thing i love about the first movie is she's not a muscle man she's not an action hero she's just a girl she's just a girl who wants to do her hair she wants to go out and date she wants to you know she's just a girl who yeah. wants to have fun but she's the most important person because she is going to create not just this life not just this particular person she's going to create the person that he becomes who's willing to fight the machines that, and that's a really good point I think in order for sci-fi to really work, what it has to do is touch on those kinds of timeless themes. And it's a genre mm -hmm. which is really predisposed to do so because the entire juxtaposition is this modern technology that humanity has just finally been able to come into contact with or develop against our natural instincts, which have been within us for thousands and thousands of years. But so much sci-fi that you see, which is done poorly, completely discounts that. And it tries <laughs> to hold on to this idea of like the new socialist man. And even though it'll claim there are, will be problems with the new technology, it's never anything that deep. Right. I think one of the challenges for a lot of the woke attempts at film is they're just, they, I, it seems like they're trying to create a new hero's journey, but for women. So um, a good example of this is Captain Marvel. Have you seen that movie? I have, uh, no, I haven't. So in a, in a, in a typical hero's journey, you're, you, you, I'm yeah. sure you're totally aware of it. I am. So basically you've got uh, uh, someone there, uh, what is it, thrust into adventure, aided by magic. You, you can look at the story of Luke Skywalker. He's just some regular kid. That's based on Joseph Campbell's right. story. Mm -hmm. yeah. All of a sudden, he is learning about how his dad was a great Jedi Knight with force powers, and he has to learn to use it. He gets a sword, and he's on this adventure, and he's just a regular kid just like you. Watching Captain Marvel was fascinating because the story there was she was always powerful, but a man was suppressing her power. <laughs> and only when she believed in herself could the power be unleashed. And I'm like, maybe they haven't figured out, maybe it's not possible, I don't know, because the story is inherently a masculine role yes, of, a, of a fighter, I, I adventurer, a conqueror. And, it, it, and maybe that doesn't work. You, you know what I thought did work? Wonder Woman. Did you see Wonder Woman? Yes. I thought that was fantastic. Yeah, first but, one, yeah. But her, uh, uh, um, the, the uh, Wonder Woman's character was very much motherly, and and idealistic. She's very girly, yeah. And but the I idealism versus the realism, and yeah. I thought that was actually you, you know where well done. you know where it works. It works in the uh, horror film Alien because that is a film about these monsters that use men as as mothers. They stick their thing in, and the guy bursts out of, the, of his belly, and basically they feminize men. So the woman, in the end, has to fight back and become an action <laughs> hero, but it's a horror movie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> good, good one, too. Dude, I want to talk about your book a little bit Please. before we go to mm -hmm. Super Chats. So it's called, uh, I can barely see it. Oh, The Truth? <laughs> the Truth and Beauty. The Truth. This is why I asked you at the beginning yep. of the show. You believe in objective truth? Of course. Oh, you're yeah. in for it. You're what, in for it. He and I okay. have this debate like every other no, this episode. Is, this, is, this, is what the, this is about the romantic poets and how they invented a way of seeing that renews the way you read the Gospels. That if you read the Gospels after reading the romantic poets, you will see what Jesus was saying more clearly. And one of the reasons for this is they lived in a time almost exactly like this one. I mean, it's the, the relationship is uncanny. The French Revolution, they thought it was going to bring paradise. They thought, this is it. We're going to get rid of all the priests. We're going to get rid of all the kings. We're going to rewrite the calendar. We're going to change everything. We're going to change language. Women are not going to be women anymore. Marriage is not going to exist anymore. And it all fell apart. It all turned to terror and world war. The Napoleonic Wars were 12 years of essentially a world war. And only a few people, the intellectuals didn't, just like with the fall of the Soviet Union, the intellectuals didn't want to let go of this radical dream that you could transform the world into a better place. And in the aftermath, of the aftermath of this utter destruction, the romantic generation was taxed with the, the job 
of recreating human consciousness. And one of the things that had fallen away, I think the central thing that had fallen away was faith. This was the first big explosion of science. It brought faith into question. People were actually becoming atheists for the first time. The first time in, in Christian Europe that people were actually saying maybe there is no God or at least there's no Christian, Christianity or there were deists or there's something new. And so these poets had to recreate human consciousness. If you lose God, if you lose the idea that there is, th this is God and this is who he is and this is what he tells me, you lose two things. You lose yourself because yourself is not connected to anything. So it's just this kind of thing floating in space. And you lose the idea of objective truth. You lose the idea that there is some kind of moral truth. So what happens? What happens is exactly what's happening now. Your inner world becomes two things at once, two completely contradictory things at once. It becomes meaningless. So you say, well, we like living in a country where women have rights. But in Muslim countries, they live in a place where you have to dress up in a bag and basically you can't go outdoors. Who's to say which is right? Which is nonsense. We're right. I mean, that we, we are actually morally right. Or compare it to, say, the slaveholding South. Was the slaveholding South less right about human rights than the North? Yes, it was less right. It was better not to have slaves. So that, that's the first thing. They teach people that their inner life means nothing. Their sense of morality means nothing. On the other hand, they teach you that their inner life is absolutely sovereign. So if in the middle of this conversation you say, oh, by the way, I'm a woman, I now have to call you a, a woman or else I'm a hateful person for not acknowledging the sovereignty of your inner life, right? What these poets came back to, the ones I study anyway, is that your inner life is actually a collaboration with creation. It is actually the part of creation that creates. Uh, Coleridge was the guy who came up with that formulation, but a lot of them sort of said the same thing. Uh, Wordsworth called it, uh, called you an agent of the one great mind. And in reestablishing this connection with what they called nature, but ultimately became the spirit, spiritual meaning of nature, they actually reestablished what Jesus was talking about. You know, Jesus said things like, you can't be creative unless you're a branch of my vine. You can't, if the branch falls off, it's not going to create any fruit. It's got to be created to the source of life. And so when you start to look at the world as a collaboration of you with reality, which is the only thing that makes sense. Come on, let's face it. I mean, you know, if I, if I, the only leap of faith you have to take in life, you know, people always talk about the leap of faith. I talk, talk about a little step of faith. You have to say to yourself, you have to ask yourself in all honesty, not in philosophy class, not in a conversation at two in the morning where you're drinking with your friends, in all honesty, do you believe that it is better to give a beggar bread than to kick a child? If, if you can say to me, well, if everybody thinks it's right to kick a child, then kicking a child is right. First of all, I think you're lying. You don't think that. And second of all, if, if you will acknowledge that it is better to give a beggar bread than it is to kick a child, after that, you're done with whether there's objective truth or not. Of course there is. Of course there is. You know there is. As I always tell people, you know, this is what I always tell like young people who are immersed in philosophy, is don't believe what you don't believe. Mm. You know, don't say you believe something because it, it somehow makes sense uh, or you can reason your way to it. You can reason your way to anything. You know, reason is, not the ult is, is one of the tools we use. But the reason the book is called The Truth and Beauty is because one of the poets, John Keats, wrote this beautiful poem which ends with the line, beauty is truth and truth is beauty. That's all you know on earth and all you need to know. And what he was saying was, you are actually a machine built for recognizing truth as beauty, not as prettiness, not like you like red flowers and I like white flowers, but that shock that you have <clears throat> when you confront truth, when you say, oh, holding a slave is wrong, and that's what beauty is. That's a, that connection that you have to this thing that is beyond yourself. Is there a, a step of faith in there? Yeah, but it's a step of faith that we all have already taken. We just don't want to acknowledge it. Why do you think that the power structures of reality, at least as far back as I can tell, have been deception and murder? The people at the top that have the control are the ones that are the most deceitful and, and are willing to lie. Yeah, because I think it's a broken world. I mean, I think that's, the, that's one of the things. The other part of the story of Jesus who said, you know, I am the way and the truth and the life is they killed him. You know? mm. And the, uh, part of the message, I think, of, that, of the Gospels is that you can kill the truth. You will kill the truth, but it doesn't die. You know, it keeps coming back. You know, and, and the interesting thing, you know, one of the interesting things to me about the passion story, the story of the death of Christ, is that 
there's no real villain in it. You can kind of pick out Judas as a betrayer, but he's killed by the church, he's killed by the government, he's killed by the people, he's killed by everybody, you know? And that is the nature of truth. So you're right, it's a broken world, and the, and the powerful and the uh, evil and the deceptive uh, do tend to rise above. But it's we, we, know, we know that because we know what's right and what's wrong. Liars have that advantage. Yeah. But how, but how would you even know there were bad, the bad guys if there were no objective truth? That's a good point. We were talking about factory farming yesterday. And, and I think Tim at one point said, you know, Ian, we just eat meat. And I was like, I was picturing us in the Roman Empire. And Tim's like, you know, Ian, we just have slaves. And it was like, I don't think that, I don't know, man, it's utilitarian. I don't think that sometimes like, do you have to kill a million people to save a million people? Like, is that right? Well, well you're absolutely right that the, um, how can I put it, the analog between physical life and the and the moral meaning of life is imperfect. It's broken. It's broken. I mean, you know, uh, the the famous trolley question: Do you uh, let the trolley run over five people uh, by accident, or do you turn it and uh, do you let it run over one person by accident, or do you turn it and kill five people? No, on it's, purpose? it's the other way around. Five people on accident, <laughs> yeah, or one person right, on purpose. Right, it's the other it's yeah. the other way around. Okay, there are some questions that can't be answered. They cannot wholly be answered. That's the world we live in. Is it is a broken world? Do you think you can do evil and it's right? Well, then it wouldn't be evil. Right? That wouldn't be evil, yeah. That would not. So do you, okay, I guess then just do you think you can destroy? I mean, I personally think you can destroy, and it's right. If in certain situations you needed to sometimes yes. start. Yeah, uh, yeah, we I, destroyed we, Nazi Germany. Things that are, yeah. things that are yeah. annihilating reality, you can yeah. destroy them. Yes, yes, um, and, and you can kill, and it's right. I mean, that's why the Ten Commandments don't say, the, they don't say don't kill, they say don't murder. The people that I are friends with the person I destroyed to preserve reality think that that's evil. Uh, but, they're, but they can be wrong. See, we know, you know, we know we can be wrong about reality, right? We know that we we've fallen in love with somebody, and it turned out no, we were just in, it was just infatuation and a past. Uh, we know Eros, that, uh, yeah. one type of love. Yes, is, it ate at least. Yeah, but we thought it was true love, but it wasn't true love. We know that people held slaves and convinced themselves it was right. It's interesting when you read their diaries; they knew they were wrong, but they convinced themselves they were right. We know you can be wrong, so that means you can be right, right? If you can be wrong, you can be right. the pro The problem is, the truth is that just because there is such a thing as truth doesn't mean that you can pound your palm with your fist and declare what it is. You know, Jesus didn't do that. He told stories, and that's a very complicated way. Socrates just asked questions. You know, the people who actually understand that there is such a thing as truth, and they are the two people, I think, on which our civilization is based, and they're the two people who both lived in a time of relativism and declared there was such a thing as truth, but neither of them said, and the truth is this. I thought Einstein but, also well, was interesting. Christ said he was he the way and the truth. There was a God. Well, Christ said he was the way and the truth. He said that, yeah, but yes, that's a exactly. very complex thing to say, right? I mean, a but he is true. I mean, the truth is a person. It's Jesus Christ. That's right. right. Yeah. That's right. Well, that's and and then there are also certain claims, like if you love me, keep my commandments, which means these are things that are right and wrong. Yes, but but the commandments are interesting because the commandments are almost always negative. And one of the questions mm. my book asks is. Once you do the negative things, what's the positive thing you're supposed to do? Because a lot of people never get to that point. They think like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm not cheating on my wife. I'm a Christian. You know, I'm not mm -hmm. drinking too much. I'm a Christian. You know, and you think like, okay, but would, would the king of heaven and earth suffer death just to tell me not to cheat on my wife? You know, my wife tells me not to cheat on her. Right? I don't actually need God to, to tell me that. Well, you know, there must be something more that he was trying to tell us. And I think he was trying to tell us that there is a way for us to collaborate with reality that is incredibly beautiful and is happening to it happens to each of us all the time. Mm -hmm. I want to. Well, I, I want to. I want to ask. Like, why is it? Do you think that among many uh, secular atheist types, they they almost have a desire to believe in in random nothingness? <laughs> yeah. Well, because it, it it they think it's going to give them power. Hmm. They think it's going to make them free, and it does. It always does exactly the opposite. I mean, that is that's kind of you know to use the word to say the word out loud that's kind of it's kind of satanic that there are certain things that offer you power anger makes you feel powerful uh you know that rage you feel against people thinking that you're totally free thinking that i can i can change my sex i just have to announce it and i've changed my sex that sounds like power but it actually enslaves you to 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 uh, elaborate a little bit further is uh, you know i had a conversation recently with someone who said that they were just a wet robot that's all they were yes yes and i'm like but why would you what makes you, I, mean, I don't know, understand why someone would believe that. The, the idea that I had was, you know, for me, I personally feel a soul or something akin to this idea or concept of an inner being, a self. There's something within me. And uh, I personally feel and have personally experienced some kind of, I guess you can say, a connection to God or something yeah. like that. 
if someone doesn't have that, I don't believe they're lying to me. I just said maybe they don't have a soul. Yeah, maybe al- they don't have a connection. Although there is, I, it is obvious that some people are better at this. They are born for it. And, and Jesus says one of the most painful things he says is to those who have even more will be given to those Mm. who have not even what they have will be taken away. And I think that that's what he's talking about, that some people don't feel that connection and some people just do. What, what, what really, really trips me out more than, you know, anything in terms like what, let me just put it this way. Having these conversations with like Michael Malice about DMT, the, the breaking through the veil, meeting other people on the other side and those conversations, I think at the very least open the door to someone should at least be agnostic. I mean, uh, you, you've heard these conversations, I'd imagine. Yeah. You know, Joe Rogan talks about it. We were talking to to Michael Malice, and he was telling us stories of meeting people on the other side, communicating, and then coming back and being like, wow, how did we share these thoughts? And I'm like, well, whatever it is, I don't know, but it certainly suggests there's something beyond us, right? Yeah. And it's something it, it, weird. Actually, I, I knew a young woman who was a socialist and a materialist, and she was about 40, I guess, and she died and, and came back. And I said, wow, did you experience anything? She said, yeah, I actually you know, left my body and I saw the doctors in the room. And I, and I said, so has that changed your mind? No. <laughs> you go like, okay. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, think, that's like, knock yourself out. You know? I, I think it was Aquinas who said to the, uh, the believer, no explanation is necessary for the non-believer, no explanation is possible. Yes, yes. I mean, that's that, I, I, I wrote in my memoir that there's, if you, if you believe uh, there's, Everything is proof. If you don't believe, no proof can be enough. I, I think yeah. we start but, to look at plasma clouds. I mean, it's almost undeniable that there's intelligence involved in the movement of plasma fields. They, well, that's, that is another thing. I mean, the science actually, you know, it made sense for there to be atheists after Newton, you know, because you could kind of extrapolate, oh, everything's a machine. But it all turned out to be much weirder than Newton said. And now, really, there's a wonderful book about this uh, called The Return of the God Hypothesis, where really uh, it's not, you know, the kind of the title sounds like it's a, a hippy dippy like religious thing but it's a real scientific book about why scientists are now saying you know there actually are there actually is evidence of an intelligence behind creation to me that's the only thing that makes sense well i I like to simplify it um, or at least explain it in sort of a way that i think most people who are secular liberal types should understand is if uh you know we build computers Computers act based on the rules that exist in reality and they, and they you know, they, they imitate intelligence or at least we're, we're producing artificial intelligence. Then for me, I don't believe that the computers we've, we've built are the, 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 the final point at which computers can ever come to. Uh, but a better way to look at it is hum- the human mind. If you are just a wet robot, well, then certainly the human brain isn't the end all be all of computational power within a living being. Certainly there is the probability based on the expanse of the universe and our scientific understanding that there will be a more powerful intellect that exists beyond human co- comprehension. It's, it's interesting when you, you know, uh, C.S. Lewis had this great line. He said, even a determinist will ask you if you will please pass the salt, meaning he, he acknowledges <laughs> that, you, you know, like that you have free will. We all know we have free will and we get talked out of it. Uh, yeah. and, and that would mean our entire experience of life is is deception and one of the things these poets were trying to say is you know your in- interior experience can be deceptive but the very fact that it can be deceptive tells you that it can also be right yeah, I've been and fasting. that there is a truth that can be deceiving you about i think right. that the chemicals like the bacteria that live on the food you eat mind control us they they, they tell you you want more of that oh, so yeah. you get these cravings <laughs> but when you fast you you strip away the lies and like the fakeness of being told the wrong thing and you start to see or at least experience the the real I, I I don't know how to describe it with human words yeah it's an energy field well I mean it, it is it is we've all been in a kind of haze of, of unknowing and delusion everybody's had that experience I mean a, a pretty girl only has to sit down next to you for you to experience some of it you know to just be go into this kind of haze of, of, of lust basically yeah so we all know that we can come out of that and be more realistic I, so I, we must be moving towards something more real. You know? I just had a thought. I, I was wondering, you know, I wonder if people who um, view themselves as, as atheists or, or what what percentage of atheists have meditated or prayed? Mm. I'd, I would imagine it'd be relatively low in terms of praying, maybe a little bit higher in terms of meditation. But I'm wondering if a lot of people just don't try to have an, an, an internal experience or something. I, I Just a thought, because I kind of feel no, like... No, I, I completely agree with this, uh, that... There, I, yeah, yeah. There, you know, the, I I grew up Catholic uh, briefly, and my family left the church. And I've met a whole bunch of different people from all walks of life, from you know anarcho punk atheist types to anarcho punk Catholics. Uh-huh. And they, you know, uh, I, I 
I've heard a lot of interesting thoughts, but the one thing that, that really uh, stuck with me is there was, uh, in terms of people who are spiritual, agnostic, or believed outright, is that there was a desire to discover more. And for a lot of the atheists, it's sort of, it's it's kind of a, um, a tendency towards, I don't want to, I'm not trying to paint every atheist this way, was sort of determinist, sort of absolute, sort of, we aren't going to know, so I don't know what I can say to that. Mm-hmm. As opposed to like, you know, the crazy people I know who go on spirit quests and go down to South America to do ayahuasca. And yeah. The people who are seeking answers and trying to find things tend to be more spiritual or believe in my experience. Well, you know, Antonin Scalia, the Supreme Court justice, told a, a great story about right outside of Washington in a church, there was a statue of the Virgin Mary that began to bleed or cry. I can't remember what it was. And he said, no reporter went out <laughs> to cover this story. And that tell I think that tells you something. I think, you know, I, I did a, a video a long time ago called Find God in 90 Days, I can't remember, 60 Days, whatever it was. And the idea was just, just go into a room by yourself where you can pray out loud for 15 minutes every day and see if you get an answer, you know, because yeah. you will. Wow. You know? If you clear your mind, I told my lie. I had a bunch of lies and secrets that I kept my whole life. When I was 26, yeah. I decided, what would Jesus do in this with this technology? He'd be honest. So I started making YouTube videos and telling people my secrets about my past. Wow. And it started to clear up my thoughts. And I no longer got interrupted by randomness. I could ask questions to my consciousness and it would respond. And now with fasting, it does it even more clear. That's really interesting. I, that, that is, that's a very, first of all, it's a very brave thing to do, but it is also... It's just incredibly true that if you let go of the lies, I mean, one of the things about Christianity is the first thing that happens, I converted at the age of 50, so I'm not, you know, I'm telling you something that really happens, is that you suddenly think like, oh, I get it. <laughs> I'm a worm, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm a schmuck. And then you're free, you know, you're free. You, you're, you're forgiven, you're done, you I, got it. And, and you have that exact same kind of experience you know, of liberation. Yeah. There was a, uh, I look back on this moment in my life as, as just perfectly ironic or, or hilarious. When I was a teenager, I read that famous quote, the only thing we know is that we know nothing. Uh-huh. Or, or yeah. who, who said Socrates. that? Socrates. Yeah. And I remember thinking that, and I'm a teenager, and I'm like, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> People think that's smart. And I was like, I know tons of stuff. And then I think I was like 10 years later, I'm 25, and I'm like, "What? A tr- no truer statements have ever been said. Shout out to Socrates. <laughs> that's but hysterical. Yeah, that's being an arrogant young kid, you mm-hmm. know. And then thinking I was so smart and this great thinker was so dumb. That's what it always, I, when it's, every now and again I'd go to college and people would protest and they'd scream. And I just think, you know, you don't know anything. What are you screaming about? You know, like, <laughs> you know I'm, I may be wrong, but you have no way of knowing. Well, You're this just, is just too young. You know? I'll tell you, but, and we'll jump into Super Chats in a second. Like, we'll get to Super Chats. It's just when we have people on this show and I'll say something passively about, say, you know, Joe Biden's illicit dealings in Ukraine and they'll say, oh, that's not true. And then I'll be like, <laughs> yeah. Allow me to go through every story, every name, every journalist. And I'm like, did you even Google this? And they're like, no. I'm like, you don't even know, but you've taken a hard stance on this. That's just weird to me. But we do got to yeah, go to. Can I just mention chance. one more thing? Yeah. Um, so uh, we, our conversation got interrupted or disjointed. I think there are some things on the just the Ten Commandments and the nature of spirituality that we might disagree about and can flesh out more, hopefully, mm-hmm. on the after show, because I think that would be a fascinating discussion. I'm really enjoying hearing Definitely. you talking about this and yeah. the way you yeah. articulate oh, yeah, yourself on it. We'll yeah. go deep. Uh, uh, I, will, I will, of course, have to burn you at the stake. No, yeah, I understand. Well, I, I, I get how it goes, but, you know, it's I, worth I, a good conversation, I think I'm related I suppose. to those Salem witchcraft. The, the Puttnams <laughs> and Putnam, I think she's in my answer. Are you saying you're the grandchild of the witches they that can burn Ian. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we're going to go to Super Chats. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have not already, you must smash that like button. We implore you. Do it for Ian. Thank you. Smash the like button for Ian. Otherwise, he gets uh, he cries and Seamus gets angry. I'm going to do that and, anyway. And I punch the walls because Ian's chaos. crying keeps me up. I, it's just... Uh, but don't, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and head over to TimCast.com. We're going to have a members-only segment up at 11 p.m. for all of you. You won't want to miss it. We're going to talk about some crazy stuff for sure. Life, the universe, the secrets, and all that. But let's read some Super Chats. Here we go. Christopher Blakely says, have Ian check out Borophine. Oh, yeah. Love your show. Watch everything. Thanks, guys. It's like What's a that? boron graphene uh, compound of some sort. I oh, hear it's wow. massively awesome. We got an important one from Pirate Taurus. He says, I saw my first chicken party today. Amazing. <laughs> So uh, you saw the chickens. I did. Scene. I was very impressed with the chickens. Well, uh, I actually I, saw the chickens having sex, which was probably oh. the, the highlight. <laughs> the highlight of my week. I think. Right. <laughs> well, it doesn't. It, you know, it, it doesn't seem consensual. <laughs> it doesn't, no. so, yeah. Um, no. Yeah. Oh, I'm, should, I'm not going to make chicken jokes, but I, I could. Have, I should prefer <laughs> borophines and allotrope of boron. I don't think graphene's involved or carbon's oh, okay. involved at all. So uh, we'll find for, out later. For, we have twenty thousand subscribers over at Chicken City. It's been a month. People love watching chickens and pets. People say they, they turn it on for their cats and their dogs when they're out, and the animals just love watching the chickens. 
Oh, that's awesome. So we have a meter. And when people give $5 super chats, treats fall down from the sky egg, we call it. <laughs> it drops treats. Once the meter hits $100, it will queue um, every five minutes. It'll, it'll run a check. If the meter has reached $100, it plays dance music and a bunch of treats start pouring out. And it's, it screams, chicken party. <laughs> That's great. We, uh, hmm. uh, yeah, I was talking to the guys with the Daily Wire and I said, look, we do really stupid things here over at TimCast. Like, I don't, I don't think any no. traditional media business would, <laughs> would do this. But oh, we're, gonna, we're working on a commercial oh, that I want to put on the on networks. And I, I genuinely, I, I plan to have it run on Tucker Carlson. And I think, I'm, I'm, I've already talked to the ad people over Tucker in the past. And they're, they're, they said, yeah, yeah, absolutely. No. You know, it's just, you pay for it, we run the ad. As long as it's a legitimate business, we'll do it. So uh, Chicken City makes money. It's our second uh, uh, highest grossing show now. <laughs> So we're going to, is it really, I mean, because people give money for treats yeah. in terms of like viewership and everything, it's relatively low, Right. but, uh, it's a, it's a business item. So we okay. can, we can have, you know, pop culture crisis is doing really, really well and getting tons of views, but it's all ad revenue based. Well, maybe you should give them some treats. That's oh yeah. We'll do a, We'll do a pop <laughs> culture live stream and we'll put the egg. <laughs> on culture party. Yeah. I think actually that would be funny to do. As long as Brett gets up on the desk and dances. That's great, but, yeah. but it can't be mealworms that fall down. It's got to be yeah, like candy. Reese's yeah. Pieces. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's raining candy on Brett. That'd be hilarious. Yeah, all right. Let's read some more. All right. Mavro St. John says, as a member of the LDS church, Utah being left-leaning is not at all surprising. They are the most left-leaning religious group. Look into it. Wow. Wow. Yeah. NOS says, hey, it's my birthday today. I'm officially 21. Can I get a happy birthday? Love you guys. All you guys are heroes to me. Happy birthday, NOS. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. birthday. Big day. Big year for birthdays. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I say that I know. every year. <laughs> Everyone's happy this year. Yeah. It's crazy. What is it? The wrong writer says, love Graf Ian's Freudian slip last night. He said metavirgins. Oh, also, hi. shout out to Mythical Vigilante. He got me addicted to your show. He's a good musician. Check out his music. That's right on. funny. Appreciate I said Metaversions, but oh. Metaversions is also very, very <laughs> funny. <laughs> All right. Raymond G. Stanley Jr. says, Seamus, the first Irish he him to be on IRL. Props. Oops. That's right. Those are my pronouns. Thank you for respecting them. That's Much correct. Appreciated. Yes. <laughs> Christina H. says, Daily Wire, please make the novel One Second After into a movie. God bless. What is that about? Do you know what I don't know. What, I don't know what it's about. I'm looking at it. One up. second after. Yeah. What is this? Sam Spade says, I joined Clavanon. <laughs> Clavanon. Clavanon. Yeah. <laughs> and feel better than I have in years. You can too. <laughs> Buy the truth and beauty. Save the Clavin. That's right. <laughs> Ryan Crabtree says, Ian, read Ayn Rand nonfiction and other objectivists such as Leonard Pekoff. Learn to distinguish <laughs> between the metaphysical and the man-made. You're saying no, Andrew? No, I, I don't, I, <laughs> don't I think, do it. No, don't, Why would don't you think it. not to do it? Because I think Ayn Rand was, well, I, I really think she was a psychopath mm. in some ways, but I think she Based. was, she, yeah. she was what? <laughs> what? Based, no, I agree with you. <laughs> yeah. No, she was A, a terrible novelist, yes. and, and B, her philosophy is ridiculous. Dude, when you I was- You make me want to read it even more <laughs> now. <laughs> when I was uh, in my life. Go ahead, go ahead. No, yeah. Expose read, my brain. Read, yeah, yeah. no, read, uh, what, what's The Fountainhead? You know, I mean, when I was in my libertarian phase, I was in my libertarian phase, and I purchased a copy of Atlas Shrugged, I just couldn't do it. I've noticed that reading and listening, they write information on my brain differently. I feel like when I read something, it like directly interfaces my brain with it. When I'm listening, I can kind of shut it out easier. Uh, yeah, I guess so. I, I, I actually, I feel like I remember things when I listen a little better, uh, but I love to read. I mean, I just love to, because it's just a direct communication with your head, you know, yeah. All right. Cyrus Nershel says, hey, Tim Cast was trying to find the spin the UFO email, but couldn't find it anywhere. I've been in IT for 13 years and the DOD is active duty, government, civilian, and contractor, but I would like to send in my resume if possible. Keep up the good work. What is it? Spin the UFO at gmail.com? That's correct. I have right. a lead on this book. This down. One second after. Uh, this is about a man struggling to save his family in his small North Carolina town after America loses a war. Mm. Oh, interesting. Oh, yeah. cool. Sends America back to the dark ages. All right. AC Gaming says, I think Elon Musk possibly bought stakes in Twitter based on him integrating it with Neuralink. My worry is governments will get their hands involved and leave backdoors to paralyze you in scenarios in people becoming fugitive. What are your guys' thoughts on this? Free the software code. <laughs> Are you going to join the, the metaverse? You're going to get the Neuralink implant and oh, plug, your, plug no, your brain in? No, but but I, you know, I, I, I might if they're good games, I might go on. You know, but, but well, no, if, I, you know, you know what? I, I actually, I, I'm not against the metaverse as a tool. You know, just like I'm not against the internet as a tool. But I think everything can be used badly. 
Yeah, and, this, and, and one getting, thing getting an implant to like imp- plug your brain yes, in. Yes, and also being on it for more than like a half hour a day. You know, I mean, I just the idea that you're going to live on this thing is is bad. I but, think that's but a if, bad But idea. if you could, what's your what's your favorite fictional, what's, what's your favorite kind of fiction genre? The novel, you know. Re- Oh, you oh uh, sci-fi fantasy. So probably it would probably be, it'd probably be mysteries. You know, if you could plug in your brain and be the detective in the mystery, actually experiencing the crime and the villains, and yeah. this, would you do it? I would do it for half an hour. You know, yeah, because I mean, I'd want to come back to real life because I think real life is really rewarding. But I, but I mean, <laughs> would you would you get the surgically implanted? port so that you could do it it's hard for me to imagine doing that you know i've never i remember taking a friend to get a a minor piece of plastic surgery and thinking i will never get elective surgery (laughs) right i I agree i i I think in order for it to become feasible they'll need wireless yeah of some sort sure i put put a plug in my ear you know (laughs) like you put on a cap and then it broadcasts into your brain but i i unless we we start I just I don't see surgical anything working for people because people don't like surgery. Not mainstream. Yeah, it'll be for people that have already like spinal injuries and stuff that are willing mm. to see if they can yeah. learn how to walk again. Yeah. I mean, maybe when they get to the point where Neuralink can actually put you in a universe and you can but, be a superhero, people might be willing to do it. I, I don't know why you would do that if it's not real. Like, I, I feel the same way about ayahuasca, by the way. If like you can take a drug that makes you see Mickey Mouse, that doesn't mean Mickey Mouse is real. If you take a drug that makes you see God... I, I, why would that be an experience? I think of it as like tuning the brain frequency to see what's already there. But but are you? How do you know you are? I mean, I don't know, but that's how I what it seems <laughs> yeah. like. Okay, um, I'm not sure. The reason I said free the software code yeah. was because if we can free the software code of Twitter and of the neural net uh, tool, then you can watch what it's doing algorithmically. Uh, free software code being AGPL3 huh. as the license. Interesting. And yeah. then if people want to take it and make a better version, that'll also be AGPL3. You'll be able to witness it. So when the government comes in and tries to steal data, you'll see the algorithm huh. where it's giving the data and what's being given. That's, a, that's, that's an interesting idea. Yeah. All right. Richard says, Tim, you often say people are cowards. Clavin came out as conservative and lost millions from Hollywood. Clavin didn't have support then, but with Daily Wire and Timcast coming together, y'all are the future. Well, we've been talking to Daily Wire about um, shows. Uh, we had uh, Dallas Sonnie. Sonnier, is that you? Sonnier. Yeah. Sonnier. I love that. Guy. And uh, uh, he was like, we'd love to do some kind of show with you guys because it would be such a powerful, you know, thing. And I'm like, we got a bunch of ideas for shows we're trying to make. You yeah. Know? That'd be absolutely fantastic. So, Andrew, what was it like breaking out of Hollywood? What was that like? I, I was thrown out of Hollywood. <laughs> I mean, no, I, I, <laughs> I was going to breaking know, out. I mean. <laughs> no, I, I, you know, I, I my, my, my salary, my income went from high six and seven figures to nothing o- almost overnight when I came out as a conservative. Uh, I mean, the, my phone stopped ringing like that. And, and you know, I, I was not a, a big deal, but I was selling scripts routinely. And if you sell two scripts, three scripts a, a year, which I sometimes did, you're making a lot of dough, you know, and it's just, I don't know. I it never, it funnily enough, didn't bother me. I mean, obviously it bothered me economically. You know, I had to sell my house and things like that. But it didn't bother me emotionally because I thought, like, I'm not going to live my life not saying what I mean because some fat jackass and all <laughs> who doesn't like it, you know. What kind of life would that be? You, know? you should write that for metaverse you. story I, I, I told you. Yeah, about now you gave show. it to me. I'm, I'm stealing it, of course. You know, oh, a, no. I, we'll, I was we'll, writing we'll, it during the show. We'll I was, sign <laughs> a deal, but I mean, <laughs> I, mean, I, mean took, I, I looked over his shoulder. There's like a lot of grammatical errors. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe that this guy Typing was in Hollywood man. for so long. Are you sure it was the conservatism? <laughs> <laughs> all right, here we go. <laughs> Colin Stevens says, Tim, Thomas Sowell hmm. vehemently disagrees about systemic racism existing. Perhaps you should get him on to have this conversation. Of course we should. Oh, would it not be, be, amazing. be amazing? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Amazing. I mean, he is the smartest man in the country. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. I, but, I'll, but I'll clarify my point because I think there, there may be a semantic um, issue. When I say systemic racism, what I'm referring to is the, the because of things like blockbusting and redlining, you now have deeply impoverished areas in Chicago. That makes it very difficult for the people who live there to transfer wealth to their kids because homeownership is the is one of the principal ways by which the middle class transfers wealth to their children. Yeah, but but why is it that other? I mean, everybody who came here got nailed in some way. I mean, you know. Well, this is going on until the '80s, right? Well, so I'm not saying that. I'm, I'm actually not sure of that. that you know, the, is, the New York Times. Well, the New York Times, oddly enough, did a piece about how some of the what was called redlining was actually just economic reality. Like people didn't want to give loans to people who weren't going to pay them back. Blockbusting was happening until the <coughs> it was, until it was made illegal. Uh-huh. You know what blockbusting was? Yeah, that's that what uh, really messed up. Yeah, uh, and 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 the reality is. Well, it, listen, nobody's going to argue about the, there was racism the, the, in this country. Right, right, right. But the market's still racist. So, 
Let me ask you. I mean, uh, in, all, in all honesty, if if a black family moved into a neighborhood, what is your expectation of property? Well, values? wait, wait a wait a minute though. You should read Helen Andrews on this. She did wrote a book called Boomers. is really interesting on this. If a black doctor moved into my neighborhood, I don't think anybody would notice. You know, I mean, I literally think that would be like you know, come on over, you know, for lunch. If if like you know a bad guy moved in or somebody who was not did not fit in that neighborhood economically or in, in terms of class, then you'd have a problem. I mean, people, you know, H Helen's uh, argument is that there was no white flight; there was flight from crime. And in a lot of times, you know, when when neighborhoods changed over, they became more criminal and people left. You know, so I don't I don't know. I like like I said, I, I, if a you know Sydney Poitier moves in next door, is anybody going to leave? Well, so, so my view on this is it's a class-based issue today. Uh -huh. It was racial uh, no before. Question, no question. There's but no that, question. But so when I, when I refer to systemic racism, I just mean that uh, in but, the past several decades, there were overtly racist policies that made it harder for the black community and, and other racial minorities to transfer wealth. And now they are disproportionately impoverished based on those things, even though it's a class issue today. But again, that happened to other races. And right, absolutely. Once, it, once it was stopped, they rose very quickly. I, I really do believe if... if the Democrats would just stop helping black people. They would get out of I don't of know if they're trying to help, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. No, they're not. I, I genuinely, Dude, I mean, look, no. being from Chicago, seeing that Democrat rule has done, it's been a disaster. Unemployment yeah. insurance is insane. It, you can't get a job or you lose it. Right. So it's enticing well, people to not like work. That yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. That's and you know, it, that was the other thing. Clinton's welfare reform really was great. It actually helped people get jobs. And then Obama gutted it, you know. Robbie Hammer says, come on, Tim, being poor isn't an excuse to commit violent crime against another human. It is 100% a cultural issue. Andrew was spot on. I don't disagree. Um, <laughs> I think if people are growing up in poor, broken communities, they're more likely to have a bad culture than people who are growing up. Yeah, with. That, that's that, that's absolutely true. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I think there's, there's great nuance to this, but I certainly think culture plays a very serious role for sure. All right. Let's grab some more Super Chats. Let's see. Sliver Bach Slips says, I think there is systemic racism in old unused laws. None are practiced now. We still have laws that allow loving on goats and men are allowed to hit their wives Sundays on the courthouse steps. Is that true? It can't be true. And maybe, you know, I just learned today that in Virginia, uh, two years ago, they made it legal to have sex before marriage. So some laws are on the books that nobody wow. pays attention to. Well, right? you know, I've, I've often said <laughs> oh, yeah. the, the laws don't matter. What matters is cultural enforcement. That's right. That's right. Um, the best example yeah. that, that I think people should really ponder on is in New York City, gender identity is, is uh, defined as self-expression in the, the actual laws, which means your self-expression could be a furry. Right. But as, I, was to I, was, I was told by civil rights lawyers, three different ones when I investigated this, that if you tried claiming a furry as your identity and you wore the outfit and you used the name, you'd be laughed out of the courtroom. <laughs> but I said, then, then what's, if, if the law says you can't be discriminated based on the clothes you wear, the name you give yourself or your self-expression, why is it different, different for a furry and a transgender person? And they said, because most people understand what gender dysphoria is in a trans person and furries would not be considered serious. And I said, that's a cultural issue, not a legal distinction. Right. So it's really about cultural enforcement and what the what our culture is willing well, to tolerate. That, that's one of the problems, like when the Supreme Court uh, had that ruling that laws protecting people according to sex, uh, against sex discrimination, covered transgenderism. Because if you walk into work in a dress, you're essentially being penalized for being a man. That, that to me, was absurd. That was not what they meant when they wrote the law. You know, you may want to make that law, but it's still not what they meant. Cigars and cig arms says, let's stop pretending that conservatives are blameless on the problem of black men filling our prisons. They have consistently refused to call out bad cops, push for criminal justice reform, and cheer on police brutality. Nah. You disagree? Nah, yeah. I mean, nobody cheers on police brutality. I think, I think the problem is the media lies so often about all these police brutality yeah. stories. It's more that the conservatives just don't care to believe it anymore. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, I, I do think... <laughs> I, I do think that when you're a bad guy and you resist arrest and you get killed, it's true that even if the cop did it wrong, which I do think happened with uh, uh, Floyd, I, I still think I, I, have, I don't have that much sympathy for you. You're still a guy who held a gun to a pregnant woman and while your friends ransacked her house. You know, I, you're not my favorite guy. I'm sorry. You know, it's like. 
He was I've dealt on, with bad cops. I, 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 I think the, the, the issue for me is these cities have a bunch of Democrats who vote for Democrats who appoint Democrat yeah. police leadership who are crooked and corrupt, and then the Democrats complain about the people that they voted for. <laughs> yeah, you don't, well, you don't is, hear you don't hear about these 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 problems in mostly conservative rural areas. It, it is amazing that in San Francisco, which I live where I lived many many years ago, and it was one of the most beautiful cities I've ever been in, it's now a hellhole. It's amazing to me a that Republicans don't run, mount a campaign that would appeal to San Franciscans, and b that San Franciscans don't say, you know what, we keep electing the same party and things get worse and worse and worse. Maybe we should change parties. There's a stigma that Republicans are anti-gay. Well, how did, where did that come from? You know, it's like, what, is it seated propaganda or did they used to be? No, I think um, it, no, I think the, 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 uh, after Reagan, there was a, a coalition of conservatives, some of whom were evangelical and they were very strongly anti-gay. You know, they very strongly felt that this was a, a bad thing, uh, biblically and they couldn't defend it in law. They couldn't say to themselves, well, this may be a sin, but that's between them and God. Or, you know, they, they just couldn't get there. Uh, it was very, very much, you know, in keeping with their their religion and their way of life. I remember when I first became a conservative, which is now back around 2000, you know, and Andrew Breitbart said to me, I want you to become part of this movement. And I said, I'm going to become part of the movement, but I don't want to hear about the gay stuff because we're wrong, you know. We're just wrong about it. You've got to let people live their lives. <laughs> Andrew said, I don't know if I can say on the, what, how much I can say on the air here, like what your, what your standards and practices are. But Andrew's response was basically, yeah, I, I want there to be more pro-American gay pornography. That was that. <laughs> oh, man. Um, yeah, I, I would disagree. I think that what basically happened is you had a lot of Christian conservatives, and not just Christian conservatives, but most of the country at the time, which saying that marriage is defined as between a man and a woman and federally funded marriage contracts shouldn't change that definition because it's not within the purview of the government. And so what the left said as a result of that and in response to that was the only explanation for that attitude is hating gay people. Mm -hmm. There's that too. Yeah. All right. Nick says, Andrew should listen to Tom McDonald, especially in God We Trust. <laughs> Have you ever heard Tom McDonald? No. Has he, ever, has he ever listened to Frank Sinatra? Damn I'm, it. <laughs> but are you familiar with Tom McDonald? No. Oh, you'd, 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 regardless of the music, really? you'd, you'd love his message. Okay. Well, yeah, I'm sure, he, no, he, he, listen, I love Zuby. You know, the Zuby's right. the greatest. You know, I mean, who's, doesn't Tom who can't have, love that guy? You know? Doesn't Tom have a song called Facts Don't Care About Your Feelings? I think so. <laughs> Sounds right. Oh, yes, I did hear that. Yeah. I did, yeah, we all got a big laugh. But does, <laughs> does he rap as fast as Ben Shapiro would on that track? <laughs> oh, I got to be honest, I think Ben could probably rap faster than most rappers. Ha, has anybody I mean, ever seriously. heard him do WAP? I this is mean, a, to me, the pinnacle of his career. This This is actually, why everyone should be everyone's mad at Ben Shapiro for not liking hip hop they should be very glad because he would dominate the game he'd be the best freestyle rapper <laughs> and he could do all playing the violin yeah. <laughs> it would be huge he'd crush all right Jacob Manning says I'm not one to give away my hard earned money but Tim since you brought the other half of the first two people that woke him to reality I'll make an exception thank you both for what you do and helping me laugh my way through all, through the fall of the Republic. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Jacob. I really appreciate it. Dylan says, classic rap has a lot of libertarian messaging. It does, absolutely. That's true. Hey, you know, Trump used to be a hero of rappers. I mean, yeah. he was in a lot of songs, yeah. JT Reed says, Andrew, have you heard Tom McDonald's <laughs> song, Blame the Rappers? It goes into how modern rap is responsible for the degeneration of today's youth. Adam Calhoun raps about how hard work got him to, got, him, got him to his success. Ryan Upchurch raps about his life in Tennessee. Very good stuff. All right. Not Really Me says, Charlie Daniels, late 70s, long-haired country boy. Well, all right. Glenn says, the best love song, Do You Remember Love, from Macross the Movie, Do You Remember Love? Not familiar with it, man. Is everybody just saying the songs they really like? <laughs> I guess that's what's going on. What's now. the best song? Super chat it right now. Yeah, tell us. <laughs> yeah, super chat the best song. Give us money to say what the best song is. Yes. If you can afford it. All right. What is this? What is this? Um, Simulated Dave says, Tim, if you're serious about DW Entertainment Envy, I'd love to discuss my short film Crit from 2020 exploring the signatories of the Polanski petition, hoping to encourage conviction in withholding cash from Hollywood. Interesting. You can always email spintheufo at gmail.com. It's the easiest way for like, this one's specifically for people who are watching the show and there's something specific we want to message. Like on our website, we have emails you can you can message, but that's the, that's the one that during the show we remember to check out. 
Orange Red says, if you like Andrew, subscribe to The Daily Wire. We are big fans of The Daily Wire. That's correct. I'm excited about the work they're doing. All right. Gabe says, sorry about my name. I don't understand why. Uh, oh, oh, I see. Yeah, I see. didn't read his whole name. Wow, that's too bad. <laughs> that's pretty bad. Why do you guys, his last name is Itch. Yeah. Why do you guys think that actual good, trustworthy people who could win elections, Joe Rogan, Jordan Peterson, et cetera, won't run? The it's too much criticism argument is selfish to me it in such an important time. Um, I think for like Jordan Peterson, he's Canadian. Yeah. Um, right. I mean, I guess he could can run in do Canada. Do whatever I want. I actually heard him say he thought he could do more good outside of that system. Exactly. Right. That's what I was going to say. I mean, do you really think Joe Rogan or Jordan Peterson would do more good for the world in some political position? Think about how much they're helping people right now doing what they're currently doing. They're clearly very good at it. Why would you take them and shoehorn them into some position that the most pathetic people in our society usually fill? And also, you know, actually doing politics is a skill. You know, so it doesn't mean they just because like they're brilliant people doesn't mean they have it. Yeah. I mean, I would, people have asked me, why don't you run for something? I said, I'm the last person who should run for something. You know? <laughs> like, I, can't, I can't balance my checkbook. If I, I weren't married, I'd be living in a dumpster. You know. So. <laughs> All right. Dwayne says, if God created the universe, he would have to exist outside it. Those mm. seeking proof assume that he would be bound by the laws of the universe. Mm. Computer programmers aren't limited by their own code. Brilliant point. But God is not limited. So God could exist within the universe it created. And I don't no, like calling no. it he either because I think that's patriarchy. No, no, no. Uh -oh. <laughs> Ian, here we go. Hey, no, he isn't. <laughs> There's not enough time left to argue with <laughs> that. Talk about he, on the he, he is a he. Um, <laughs> and it has a long way His here. preferred pronouns. <laughs> you have to well, let's, let's, them. let's actually save this for the after show. Yeah. We'll have a great conversation. I think it'll be fun. And we'll, we'll, get, we'll have more time. So let's just read a few more of these super chats and, and name some of the best songs. Um, M169 says, best song is The Greatest Show on Earth by Nightwish. Thank oh. you. Totally wasn't my fault, says Staying Alive by the Bee Gees. Mm. Oh, yeah. yeah. Sam Ard says Best Libertarian Death Metal Record Ever is 1776 by King Conquer. Huh. Their bassist just passed away. Rest in peace. Oh, mm. Seth Klein says So glad to hear you bring up Handlebars by Flowbots. It depicts current reality perfectly. You see, Andrew, in the song Handlebars by <laughs> Flowbots, yeah. in the music video at the end, there's a guy challenging an authoritarian regime. And all of the jackboot cops banging their shields have Black Lives Matter on really? their shields. <laughs> no. And the song's from, because it's the communist fist, it's the red salute. But the song is from, I think, like, what is it, 13 years ago or something? Yeah, some quite 14 like years that. ago. Yeah. So they make this song, and the bad guys have the, the communist fist, which is now the BLM fist. Right. And they're killing people. And that's basically what the song is saying, that these people are like, I can do whatever I want. No one can stop me. I, since everybody's telling me what rap music, I want to tell you what to listen to, all right? I want, I, you should go out and get two albums. If, if that's what they call them, uh, <laughs> uh, what, one is one is Ella and Louis, and the other yes. uh, the other is Ella and Louis again. Best pop records Delightful. ever made. Yes. Very you know, you know, my thing is though, I like um, music. For me, I love political music. Uh, do you? Okay. So, uh -huh. so <coughs> there's some pop songs I might be like, oh yeah, sure, yeah. it's fun to play. But I really do like songs that have uh, a message. Uh -huh. So I, I do like, you know, I, I've always been critical my whole life of music that was meaningless. I grew up listening to a lot of punk stuff. Okay. And that, it started with pop punk and then I listened to more like actual punk stuff and then started listening to more like independent music and things like that. But uh, I, I like I like songs with meaning. Uh, nothing really in between. Huh. Either oh, just a silly, boppy, whatever, yeah. or it's going to be something. So, like, all the stuff that I write has deeper meaning, all the songs that I that I put together that we're working on. Will of the People. Has anyone said yet, Will of the People? Yes, oh, that's right. Better. Will of the People is the greatest song ever. <laughs> uh, that's my song. <laughs> is it? Oh, yeah. Okay. Tim uh, actually super chatted that in himself. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Will of the oh, People. That was, that you was, guys got to listen to that one. That was Raymond G. Stanley <laughs> Jr. Thank you, Raymond. <laughs> It's right. That says, wait, that says Pim Tool oh, on oh, it. No. What is it? <laughs> oh, here's a good idea. Brayden says, y'all should have all guests roll the 100 die and rank them all on a leaderboard, oh, almost snap. like old Top Gear Celebrity Racetrack laps. That's a good idea. Here you go, Andrew. All right. 100 sided die. So, so what do I? Ha what am I doing here? Just, just roll it. Give it what just you got. roll it. And there it goes. We got the wine shot and, on this. And uh, no. How do, think... know, how do you know what it is? <laughs> it's on the top. Oh, it's on the top. 33. Oh, that's 33. my, that's my number. Big number. number. Yeah. I rolled a 100. Oh. Yeah, that was hard. That was on. Um, that was hard. That was Biden's during that during his oh, campaign yeah, speech. Yeah, yeah. Was that was that when Lauren was drunk? 
Yeah, I think yeah. so. Yeah, <laughs> that was fun. All right, everybody. If you haven't already, smash that like button, subscribe to the channel, share the show with your friends. And if you want to hear a discussion about religion, spirituality, philosophy, and all of that crazy moral and ethical stuff, we're going to get into that in the after show over at TimCast.com. So sign up, become a member. We greatly appreciate your support. Share the show if you really do like our work. You can follow us at TimCast IRL basically everywhere. You can follow me at TimCast. Andrew, do you want to shout anything out? Uh, the truth and beauty, you know, you should pick it up. It actually, it's not written for people who like poetry. It's just written for people who want to look at the world a different way. Cool. You know what? Uh, I usually pr plug Freedom Tunes. Got to plug something else, though. I, you know, I'll plug Freedom Tunes as well. Go check that out. <laughs> Earlier, I made a dig at Televangelist. Mostly not a fan, but there are some great ones, like the original Televangelist, Fulton Sheen. I'm going to shout him out. Go check out some Bishop Fulton Sheen videos. They're incredible. Uh, what's the best place for people to get your book right now? A Amazon is always helpful because it rises up the ranks oh, when yeah. you buy it, and that's good um, for me. And I want to shout out your Twitter, too. Andrew Clavin on yep. Twitter. Yep. All right. Thanks for coming, man. Great to meet it's you. It's a pleasure. It's really nice meeting you guys. Ian Crossland. Catch you guys later. And you guys may follow me on Twitter and minds.com at Sour Patch Lids as well as sourpatchlids.me. We will see you all at timcast.com just about an hour or so. Thanks for hanging out. Bye, guys.